uh, today's agenda is going to be a quick presentation by me, a slideshow that talks about who we are, all of us together, and then why we might want to use Earth Engine. And then a quick background, since we're going to focus in this workshop on vegetation, a quick background in uh, vegetation indices, and in particular NDVI. And many of you already know this, so this will be review, but it's just to bring everybody up to the same level before you launch into the the wonder that is uh, engine, Earth Engine computation. And then we're going to switch to Annie to do this hands-on workshop, uh, this very nicely organized workshop. There's a self-paced or uh, work with Annie kind of uh, approach to it. So if you want to dive in and go self-paced, you can. If you want to, um, you know, go step by step with the crew, you can. So we'll explain all of that um, in a bit. But before I start on the introductions, I want to tell you a little bit about the group that uh, runs these workshops. We are a statewide program called Informatics and GIS, IGIS. We're situated in the University of California Ag and Natural Resources Division. This is a group out of the University of California that strives to connect UC research with local communities around agriculture, natural resources, nutrition, youth development. We're essentially a network across the state of California with people, researchers on uh, cooperative extension offices throughout counties. We have uh, staff at research and extension centers around the state and at affiliated UC campuses. And UCNR runs a number of statewide programs that do really impactful work like 4-H or California Naturalist or UCIPM. And one of those statewide programs is the informatics and GIS team that um, I run and that all of the folks you're gonna meet today work for. And our goal is to help you integrate cutting edge geospatial tools into your work. We do this through trainings like this. We do this through research support. We have a service center if you have a job that, that uh, you'd like um, us to help you with. We also have a drones program. If you're interested in any of these, the website is there. We love all things mapping. And so we look forward to talking to you about your work and um, what you gained out of this workshop. So this is us, the UC a &R Informatics and GIS team. I'm Maggie, I'm the director. We also have Andy Lyons, Sean Hogan, Shane Fire, and Robert Johnson. They're gonna be your support team here behind the scenes. If you're having any trouble with the workshop, if something's not working, we're all here in the background. So you can uh, put in a chat or um, ask for some help. And then we have Annie Taylor. She's a Google Earth Engine expert and she's gonna be running the bulk of the workshop. So here, this is your support team um, for the rest of the afternoon and we're, we're thrilled to be here. And who you are, we um, have a lovely group. We come mostly from, uh, uh, the, from North America. We're across the US, mostly in California, but we also have folks from Mexico. And if you are comfortable doing so, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So if you could, if you're comfortable doing so, if you could now write a few words in the Zoom chat quickly, your name, your status, and your comfort with Earth Engine on a scale of one to 10, 10 being, you know, really, it's pretty much your jam, and one being you haven't really used it before. And that way we can kind of have a running thread here and um, learn a little bit about you. And if you want to include um, a quick sentence about why you came to the workshop, we'd love to see that as well. So I'm gonna bring up the chat and see what we've got. Hey, David, nice to see you. Lovely to see you, Melissa. <laughs> Status is Friday, indeed. Indeed, it is Friday afternoon. Great, this is great, you guys. A nice thread here. Cool, food science, a cartographer, land use and forestry, excellent. UCIPM represented, love it. Great, we've got some uh, um, beginners, which is 
always welcome and you're going to be um, really pleased when we dig into the workshop because Annie's laid this out so it's going to be a lot of fun even if you are at a zero or a one which some of you are so lovely that's it's great to read these keep them coming I'm going to uh, go back to the slides here and just we'll uh, sort of set the stage for what we're going to do. We're going to talk today about Earth Engine, but there are a lot of Google Earth platforms that you might be familiar with. The most common one probably is Google Earth, and that's this um, global detailed visualization of the Earth where you can zoom in, pan around, really explore Earth data in all its richness. You can go back in time, you can zoom in. So that's Google Earth. Earth Engine is the thing that we're going to be talking about today. This is a planetary scale platform for Earth science data analysis. That's their tagline. The key thing is this is an analysis platform. This is a place to do computation. And this is what we're going to focus on today. But Google Earth has launched a couple of new ones as well. Earth Studio. I just started looking at this. <laughs> it's pretty wild stuff. It's how you can use the Google Earth data to build um, videos. There's Earth Virtual Reality, so you can, uh, you know, use uh, Earth in your virtual reality toolkit. And there's also Google Earth Outreach, which is a way to empower positive change for people around the world using geospatial data. A Berkeley grad, I might say, runs that program. So um, we're very excited about that. But we're gonna focus today on Earth Engine. And why you might wanna use Earth Engine, um, as I say, they call it a planetary scale platform for Earth science and data, Earth sciences data and analysis. You might wanna use Earth Engine to access massive amounts of Earth science data sets, remote stent, we started with remote sensing, but there's so much more there now too. Climate data, other, other Earth observation data. You might want to use, use Earth Engine to quickly analyze Earth observation data. You can really do analysis a lot faster than you can on your desktop. You might want to develop tools and apps for others to interact with data. You might want to join a community, a growing community of passionate pr practitioners in this field. You might find this a way, a good way to learn to code, and it is a lot of fun. So we hope these are some of the reasons why you're here. We always like to say, you know, what this, what the tool we're focusing on in our workshops doesn't do as well. And so Google Earth Engine doesn't do as well as say ArcGIS Pro in working with vector data. So kind of the, the real detailed editing or dissolves or vector geoprocessing, you're better off working in a traditional um, GIS software package. But that said, you can you can do some stuff with with vector data. There's it's not really a drone um, platform. There's not um, equivalent drone photogram photogrammetric capabilities like there are in other softwares, and it's really um, not ideal for cartography and design. If you're really interested in you know the, the cartographic design aspect, you can um, port your data out into something like Pro or or your favorite. Um, GIS design workshop. But what it does do, it does very well. And the reason it's such a great and exciting platform is because of the data that goes into it. So let's just take a step back and talk about one of the data sets. And it's really the sort of founding building block of Engine that is the Landsat data catalog. So Landsat, the Landsat program, it's a US program. The original, the first Landsat 1 was launched in 1972. Landsat 8 is up, up now. So this is a decadal scale record of Earth observation from, from orbiting satellites. It's tremendously rich. It's, um, it's an incredible resource. And it is all now available through Google Earth Engine. And the reason it's available is because in 2008, the decision was made by the USGS and the federal government to make Landsat data free. And there are a lot of graphs like this out there, but you can see how 
that key 2008 date has, has resulted in increase in Landsat citations. It's resulted in increased downloads of this data, increased use of the data since uh, the, the data was made free. Prior to this, in the 80s and 90s, you really had to pay a hefty fee you know, nearly $3,000 for a single scene. And so you download a scene, pay the bill, download a scene, pay the bill. So a lot of cutting edge work really looked at one Landsat scene where now you can, as you're gonna do later on, really delve into a, a regional record or a very deep record in time. And so um, Engine, Google Earth Engine has made, um, has, has taken that Landsat, Landsat archive and um, made some incredible things happen. The first paper that we cite um, using Engine at the global scale was uh, Matt Hansen's 2013 paper in science that was a, looked at a global record of forest change, forest loss, forest gain, and forest turnover at the global scale. Incredible work. And soon after came a global surface water change um, paper. There's been global urban land use, global impervious surfaces. These are just a, 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 few, a few selections. At the continental scale, there's been a lot of amazing work looking at continental scale of cropland, say in all of Africa or all of Europe. Uh, there's been continental scale looking at land cover change and then continental scale looking at uh, various um, ecosystems like uh, all of Canadian forests, say, or all of Canadian wetlands, say. These all make use of that Landsat archive in Google Earth Engine. But the, the key thing about these, this data set, it's, it's wonderful that we have it, but these data get big. So at the scale of, the, of Landsat, so 30 meter pixel, 30 meters by 30 meters on a side, California has 500 million pixels for, for one Landsat band. China or USA has 10 billion pixels and the globe is 600 billion pixels. So you cannot do this on your desktop. You've gotta be um, harnessing the power of high performance computing, parallel computing, distributed computing. All of these, this, these terms mean we are taking this data and we are farming it out to somewhere um, uh, outside of our of our desktop to work. And that's what Google Earth Engine does. It takes your original image or your original raster data set. And because it's a raster, which is just a grid, it takes that and chops it up into known chunks. Each chunk can then be operated on by a processor. That processor can be anywhere on the on the in the uh, Google system of, of processing nodes. So these things can be distributed around all Google server farms. The, a simple operation is run on that chunk and then the result is, is, is completed. And then those chunks are brought back together to be reassembled into that product. So this means it's lightning fast and it's all possible because we're dealing with raster data that gets chunked up very easily. So the, the Google Cloud infrastructure is what makes this possible. On top of that, Google Earth Engine is an API. So it's an application programming interface and it has um, uh, APIs in JavaScript and Python so that you can interact with that massive data set and all of this, this work that's done in the background is done for you. So that's the background behind Google Earth Engine. We are going to be talking about vegetation. So very quickly, I wanted to do a primer on vegetation indices. These are spectral metrics that help enforce or uh, reinforce where vegetation is and what the condition of vegetation is. And all of these in remote sensing make use of the very simple fact that vegetation interacts with electromagnetic energy in a very unique way. It absorbs light in the red visible light and it reflects strongly in the near infrared. And because nothing else on earth does th those two things, you can take advantage of that, that difference between the red reflectance and the near infrared reflectance through a simple ratio that's just near infrared minus red 
divided by near infrared plus red. So it's scaled from negative one to one and it cuts through everything and just says, here's where you've got vegetation, here's where you don't. Very, very simple and uh, um, really quite, quite useful. So these orange boxes just show, showcase on the left where we have this difference in, in reflectance. And then on the right, you can see a vigorous vegetation, high chlorophyll content gets a high near infrared, non-vigorous vegetation, low chlorophyll content, the near infrared starts to decline. And so it's, like I said, it's a quick shorthand to look at where vegetation is. And in some cases, what's the condition of that vegetation? So on the left here, we have a true color composite, which is a satellite image um, designed to look um, a, you know, like visible, what you'd expect to see if you were flying over it. And on the right is the NDVI. It's a single value from negative one to one that highlights vegetation and, and vegetation condition. And it's, it's great for, um, for looking at vegetation, looking at vegetation change, but it's so simple. It's just each pixel, that formula near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red is applied. And the result is this single value from negative one to one that tells you something about vegetation. It's not perfect. It has some problems, but it's a good shorthand and we're gonna play with it this afternoon. There are a lot of other vegetation indices out there. There's NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which we just talked about. There's something called Enhanced Vegetation Index that tries to, to alleviate some of the problems of NDVI. There's Green NDVI that makes use of the green um, band instead of the red. There's something called Visible Atmospheric Resist, uh, uh, Atmospherically Resistant Index, which just makes use of the visible light. There's a lot of these. There's some interesting um, you know, post-fire burn indices. All of these are just simple algebra applied on a pixel by pixel level to get at this uh, spectral response of vegetation to light. So that's what we're going to be playing with today and where we're going to be playing with it is at the Sierra Foothills Research and Extension Center. This is one of these UCA and our Research and Extension Centers. It's a couple of drone videos um, that we've flown the uh, uh, SFREC is on the Yuba River. It's gorgeous. It's got uh, grass, oak woodland, riparian habitat types. And the research there includes programs on beef cattle production, nutrition and health, rangeland quality, oak woodland. It's, it's a lovely place and you're gonna be visiting it, visiting it um, virtually uh, today. So with that, um, I'm going to turn everything over to Annie and um, she is going to kick off the workshop agenda and um, uh, get us started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maggie. I learn something every time I get to sit in with you. Um, just a wonderful teacher and that's great background for what we'll be talking about today. So welcome everyone, I'm Annie. It is so great to see everyone today. I love doing live workshops. Today will be, as you know, an introduction to Earth Engine followed by a case study at SFREC where we'll be analyzing changes in NDVI over space and time. So first things first, we've dropped this in the chat 1 million times, but if you have not yet registered for Earth Engine, that's gotta be approved by folks at Google. So click that first link in the chat and sign up right now, preferably with a Gmail account. It's gonna be easiest. And go ahead and also click that second link uh, to open up our workshop worksheet, which will help you um, stay on track. If you space out for two minutes, you can always find what you missed in that worksheet. Um, and it also allows you to self-pace if you've got a good handle on Earth Engine, which is some of you definitely do. So feel free to use that worksheet to self-pace. So a little bit about me, I'm a second year PhD student here at Berkeley and I use Earth Engine in the study of ecolog ecological impacts of indigenous stewardship here in the Bay Area. Um, and so I'm just really excited to be here. I love this tool. I love the questions that you all ask. It really helps um, bring to light some of the nooks and crannies of Earth Engine that I might not think to talk about. And so your questions are really valuable and I'll try to pause often to get those questions. So with that, this workshop is very hands-on. 
Um, we're going to get you in Earth Engine using the tool, and so there might be some glitches or some issues. And you saw earlier, we have a whole team of people here. Um, you can chat Shane, Sean, Maggie, or myself individually if you have a technical issue, or you can just drop a general question in the chat, and one of them will, will privately chat you. And these people are so helpful. They'll, they'll hop into a breakout room with you. They'll solve your problems. So please don't, uh, don't hesitate to, to use that technical support. One other thing, I know that sometimes um, programming communities have not been welcoming to all people in all walks of life. And so we're part of changing that here. And that means being mutually supportive to each other, acknowledging that we're growing together. That includes me, I'm not an expert. I learn so much every time I get in a room with all of you. Um, and this could mean crediting people who've helped us or sharing scripts, making sure to credit folks whose scripts we've worked off of. So all of those things to help make it more inclusive. And there is no judgment in this space. Um, I'm not an expert programmer, so let's, we'll learn together and improve that way. So definitely, um, I hope to make it as inclusive as possible and please follow up with us in the feedback at the end if you have ideas for ways we could do that. Okay, so now I'm gonna to get to this slide. It's a quick overview of the format before we're diving in. Like I said, the worksheet is designed so that you can pace yourself and sort of just tune in to see if we're answering a cool question that you're interested in. But mostly you could work at your own pace. You could jump ahead to a step that seems interesting to you and then ask questions in the chat as they come up. So we might not get to your question until we get to that step together, but feel free to pace on your own, um, particularly if you already know the basics. You might, step to step, you might skip to step three, something like that. Okay, on the note of programming, we'll be working off of scripts, which is just a set of instructions or a document that's written in a programming language, in this case, JavaScript. So we've created a workshop script that contains each of the main six steps in this worksheet, and that can support you in any way as you move through this workshop. You might just open the script and take a look as we talk about it together. You might create your own script from scratch to get that hands-on practice and then use the example script to check your work as you go. Any, any combination works well. So that's there for you. And we'll open that together in a moment. And that brings us to just logistically, it's hard to do a virtual workshop where you've got a worksheet, you've got my head and screen sharing in the background um, and you've got your Earth Engine browser window open. So that's three different windows to be juggling and that can be really hard. So some folks split their screens. Um, some folks use control tab or command tab to switch between windows quickly. It's complicated and you'll see me sort of clunking through it too, that's okay. Um, and I'll try to go to, at a pace that allows you to sort of switch over to my window if you need to see something. Um, but um, uh, apologies in advance, it's a little tough, on, especially on a small screen. We'll be taking roughly two bio breaks, probably close to the hour, depending on the flow of our workshop. Um, and I think at this point, I'm going to drop the link to the um, script into the chat. And folks who are not new to Earth Engine, that's for you to go ahead and get started if you'd like to jump ahead. If you're new to Earth Engine, you don't need to do anything yet. We'll open it together. Um, but this is just to let you know that you can, if you'd like to self-pace, you can go ahead and do that now if you haven't already. And um, we'll come back together at the end for a group photo for those who are willing. We found that that can be um, kind of a nice thing to do together. So are there any questions before I dive into the workshop? You can ask in the chat or you can unmute Annie, while mm -hmm. going through the exercise, I have a, um, a possible suggestion for people that work on this individually. If you have a script editor, you can copy and paste that script into your script editor, be it like notebook plus plus or whatever it is. And then you can cross reference that if you get out of place, say if you have your syntax off or something, it's useful. Awesome. I think I understood most of that, but it's okay if you didn't. All right, any other questions from folks for the chat or unmute? Awesome, we got a thumbs up. I'm so excited. Live workshops are really fun. Um, I think we're gonna have a blast. Okay, so with that, I'll say goodbye to the folks that are self-pacing. We'll see you soon for a group photo. And for folks who are pacing with me through the introduction to Earth Engine, 
Um, the first step is going to be to go to the Earth Engine Playground at this link. This is, you're gonna to wanna to open this link with whatever Google account you've signed up for Earth Engine with. So for me, I have a personal Gmail that has my Earth Engine account. So I'm gonna open it um, in my personal Gmail. You might be asked to sign in when you click that link. So we're just trying to get you up and running in the, in the playground right now. Also, if um, I like to have the worksheet up, I'm gonna be working off of that. So I'm on step 1.1 .1 on page three and I'll try to call out where I am frequently. Annie, at this start. point, do you wanna share your... Um... Yeah, I do, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is what, when I go to this link, this is what I see. I see an empty script um, and we'll walk through the main components of this. If you are having trouble getting access to the Earth Engine Playground, please use the chat and we'll try to get you up and running. I'm gonna open my chat actually on the side just so I don't miss anybody. Okay, great. So what, what's going on here? Let's talk through the main components of Earth Engine. What you're seeing here at the top center of the screen is what's called the code editor. That's where we're gonna do all of our writing. The bottom center is the map. So anything we add to the map or create for the map is gonna be shown here. This is the console where we're gonna see if we created a table or a cool chart, which you'll do soon. That would be printed out here in the console. And then on this area, I gotta move it because of all of the zoom boxes. Um, this is the script manager on the left. And this is gonna look different for everyone. I have been using Earth Engine for a long time and have a ton of random script folders. So don't worry about it. This is like a file explorer. Um, it's just a list of all the scripts that you have. Okay. Any questions so far? We're gonna get going with writing some stuff in this code editor to give you a sense of what that looks like. So the first step is gonna be just to write your name in the code editor. Don't worry about any errors. We're not writing JavaScript yet. This is just to make sure you can save a script. So I'm gonna hit save. And I'm, I'll be able to um, set the name of the file here. I'm gonna actually put this in a given folder so I can find it. And I'm gonna call this sentinel underscore NDVI. And then my initials is, you know, name it whatever you'd like. You could name it Earth Engine Workshop. You could get really specific. This is just sort of a, a filler example. And then press okay. Some of you might run into some issues here. So if, you, if this is your first time saving a script ever in Earth Engine, you might be prompted to create a home folder. Mine is my first and last name, Annalise Taylor. Um, oops, trying to toggle between windows. So you'd have to create a home folder, name it, press create, and then you'd have to create a main folder or a repository. Folder and repository are synonymous. And you could name it home, you could name it default, anything that makes sense for you, and then press create. And those uh, names will be permanent. So don't do anything you'll regret. And then you'll be able to save your script. Okay, I'm gonna show off some of my favorite pieces of this code editor because you can see there's a lot going on here. I live by the docs tab. This is documentation, uh, is, docs is short for documentation. And this is basically a place where you can find all of the menu options that Earth Engine is providing. So this is sort of the documentation of the API, meaning this is the whole menu of things you can do. And what's really useful is that you can filter it. So pretty soon we'll be working with image collections. So if I wanted to see what type of tools can I use with an image collection, I could search image collection, which is one word. Here are all the functions that act on an image collection. And this will make more sense soon if it doesn't already. Oh my gosh, where is it? Oh, here it is. This is, I wanted to show off one of my favorites that I use all the time. This is a tool called First. So when you're searching the docs tab, you can search for whatever word you're looking for and then click to see a pop-up window of what that tool does. This is really great. This is the description here at the top. This tells me what inputs I would need to um, input into the function or tool. In this case, they're calling that an argument. Argument, input, parameter, you know, all of these are synonymous. And then it's gonna return or output that image, the first image of a collection of images. So there's 
there's sort of the workflow of the docs tab and I go there all the time to see what's possible in Earth Engine or um, if I'm stuck and can't, can't find a certain tool. Other thing I use all the time is the search bar. So I'm gonna go up here. Oh, we're getting some things in the chat. Oh yes, for uh, the file ending in .js, you don't have to do this anymore, but you did have to add the JavaScript um, file type before. And so that's just a holdover that I, that I use, but it's not necessary. Um, okay, so as you can see, you can search for places and data sets that are in the Earth Engine application. So I could search for Berkeley, California in the map you'll see will update to show Berkeley, which is really cool. And I can also search for data sets. So in this case, um, we're not working with Landsat data today. Um, we do have a recorded Landsat workshop if you're interested in those data. But you can see you could search Landsat and see all the Landsat imagery collections available. So this is super powerful. There's tons of stuff available and it's all, you know, if you're curious about any type of data, is, is there land cover data? in Earth Engine. Yes, in fact, there is. Um, so anything you can think of, use that search bar to explore. It's really, I find it really useful. All right, one of my, we're almost done with these basic tools, but I'm just showing you my favorite things. This next tool is the inspector. And so what I just did, and should have done a little bit slower, I clicked on the inspector tab here on the upper right. And now my cursor has changed to this crosshair sort of target symbol. So if I click anywhere on the map, you'll see I get this um, output here in the inspector tab. It tells me the coordinates of that point, my zoom level. So this range is 0 to 24. If I was zoomed in more, see that zoom level increase in the scale at which I'm loading the map. Um, if Once we add layers to the map, you can always use the inspector tool to view the values of any layer at that point. So this is really cool when you're exploring your data. Okay, now we're going to type our first line of JavaScript together. I'm just gonna go back to the console to deactivate the inspector tool. And I'm gonna delete my name because that's not JavaScript. And if you're following along with me, you can type this too. I'm typing print, all lowercase, I'm gonna type a parentheses and it'll auto complete that parentheses for me. And then I'll type hello world. This is a common first code line. And then I'll add a semicolon at the end. Okay, it's okay if none of that makes sense. Just going to show you how cool this is. You've just written some JavaScript that prints those words hello world to the console. So that's sort of an example of how the code editor and the console interact. Okay, are there any questions? I think now we're going to open up the workshop script together. Um, so Sean, you could drop that link one more time in the chat, that'd be really helpful. And I'm going to, I'm actually gonna save this cause I'll work out of this script later. Um, but for now I'm gonna open up our workshop script. And so those of you, um, I already have it because it's it's a script that I own under owner. If you've already clicked that link earlier, it might be under your reader tab. Um, but if not, go ahead and open the script. Okay, thank you, Sean. Wonderful. So the first thing you're going to want to do, you should have a read only copy of this script when you click that link. In, into your Earth Engine account. So again, if you have multiple Google accounts, just make sure you're on the right account browser. Um, and then you'll wanna make some change. Maybe you could add your name um, and click save or save as to save a copy um, to your account. That way you can edit it. Does that make sense to everyone? Making sense so far? Okay, great. So I've included the link in the worksheet if you want to dive more into different parts of the playground, um, which is what Earth Engine calls this, this interface here, the playground. So 
But with that, we're all done with step one. If no one's having any technical issues, we're basically ready to go. And we can um, talk a little bit about JavaScript and then get into the analysis. Any other, anything to pause, questions, thoughts? Okay. No questions yet. Awesome. So I'm now on step two of the workshop in the worksheet. I'm on page four. And this step is all about getting a feel for JavaScript without becoming overwhelmed. So I learned Earth Engine not by becoming an expert in JavaScript, but by slowly adapting existing scripts um, to work with different data sets and slowly getting a sense for how, how it works. So there are no points for writing scripts from scratch. Most of us are adapting or working off of um, different scripts written by other folks. So don't worry if this looks really ugly at first, I think you'll get a sense of it. And Earth Engine has written some um, menu options that look pretty good and work pretty smoothly, even though JavaScript isn't always so pretty. Okay, I'm gonna show you what it looks like to work off of an example script, which is again, how I learned. And it's a great way um, to get up and running quickly. So to do that, I'm gonna make sure I'm on my scripts manager tab here in the left. I'm gonna go down and click examples to expand it. And these are part of everyone's Earth Engine account. They're examples provided by the team. I'm going to expand the image folder. These are just folders showing you different um, groups of example scripts. So I'm gonna expand image and click on this first one called from name. Now, when you click on a script, it'll populate to the code editor. So if I had changes I wanted to save, I'd wanna save before I clicked on any other scripts. So I'm gonna say abandon my changes and you can see the example script populates and I'm just gonna hit run. This is really exciting. You're already using Earth Engine. Um, you could do that with any of these example scripts and get really cool ideas. And all of the content is here for you to work with and edit off of. So that's really, that's really what Earth Engine is, is working off of these amazing example scripts or other folks work. So it's okay if JavaScript isn't going to come easily to you all at once. All right, so let's talk about what we're looking at here. The first thing that's weird about JavaScript is that every line or chunk of code is going to have to end in the semicolon. And Earth Engine does a good job of reminding you of this. So if I forget a semicolon for whatever reason, Earth Engine will let me know here. So I'm just gonna add that back. Also, JavaScript is case sensitive. So you saw earlier when we typed print, it turned pink or purple, sorry, meaning that the API recognizes this as a tool that you can use. If we were to type with a different case, you can see it's, it, it's black, it doesn't recognize this as a tool. So remember, if you're getting an error, it could just be an issue of the case, upper or lower case um, things. The other thing is that we have to let Earth Engine know when we're creating a new variable or a new object that we'd like it to store. And to do that, we use the keyword bar, which you'll see on this, um, on this first line. I'm gonna zoom in a bit. Is that zoomed in enough? Do you feel like you can see? Maybe that's too much. Okay. Looks good to me. Okay. So you can see we're using the keyword bar to say, this is a new object. We're gonna name that variable and then we're gonna set it equal to some object. And we'll get more into that and that'll start to make more sense. But that's what you're seeing when you see the word bar. That just means this is a new variable. Text, also called a string object, uses single quotes, that's the convention. You can use double quotes, just make sure that the, the quotes match. So don't do things like this. Earth Engine doesn't like the double and single quote together. Um, so this is a text object or string object between quotes. The other thing you're seeing in this example script are these green lines that all start with these two forward slashes. And that's called a comment. Comments are essentially a way for humans to read a programming script. So you can add any type of information about, you know, here's what I'm doing. This line is centering the map. This line is displaying the image. And those comments are completely ignored by the computer. Something comments are so useful in Earth Engine because you cannot run a single line of code. You have to just press run and run the whole script. And so if I didn't want some one line of code to run, 
I could use command or control depending on Mac or Windows machine. I would use command forward slash and that toggles whatever line into a comment or, or uncomments it. So that's really useful. Comments are great, helps you understand. Um, I, the worksheet goes into block commenting as well if you're interested in that. And I've already mentioned that the code editor does underline any issues in your code. So if I had a, a rogue parentheses, it would let me know. So it, it has your back, it's on your side, even if sometimes it's really frustrating. Okay, so what else are we seeing in this example script? We're seeing what's called an ee.image. So there are two common data structures or types of data in Earth Engine. The first are images, and the second are features or geometries. And so if you're familiar with GIS software, you can think of an image as any raster data. So this is data that's represented as pixels. A feature or a geometry is any vector data. So this is anything like a point or a line or a polygon in space that's represented using coordinates. You'll see image collections, which are, which you might already have a uh, guess. An image collection is a stack of images or a collection of images. Um, this is sometimes called a raster stack in other, other software. Or um, a group of features is a feature collection. So that's sort of what those terms mean as you see them. Um, also noted that projection of Earth Engine is Maps Mercator. So if you care about projections, that's uh, might be important for you to know. If you don't, that's okay. And again, just to reiterate, I'm on now page five of the worksheet. We have to tell Earth Engine what type of variable we're creating when we create a new one. And so that's why you see this construction here, ee.image. We're telling it, make an image um, object. And so often we have to tell Earth Engine, make a feature, make an object, and that's generally what the construction would look like. Okay, now we're gonna figure out what is happening here. We're gonna dive into what's called each of these functions. So a function is the same thing as a, a tool that you might use in ArcGIS. A function is simply some um, awesome algorithm that takes some inputs and spits out some output. So you already saw that um, when we looked at the docs tab and clicked on first. You'll see this is just a function. It takes an image collection and outputs an image. So functions in Earth Engine frequently look like this. There's some type of function. Generally, it's, it's changed to purple to indicate it recognizes this function. A parentheses, um, which then includes all of the inputs in uh, separated by commas within the parentheses. And then you throw that semicolon on the end. So what are these functions doing? In this case, I'm gonna show you a really cool keyboard shortcut I use all the time, which is on a Mac or a PC to put your cursor right next to the open parentheses and press control space. You don't have to hold it. You'll see this pop-up window come up with the same great information we got from the docs tab. So we can see, okay, this function set center takes a longitude coordinate, a latitude coordinate, and then optionally takes a zoom level. And you can see zoom level is optional, it's, it's italicized here. And there's sort of more detail below, long lat zoom. Okay, so let's mess with the set center variable just to give you a sense. So I'm gonna try I'm gonna change the latitude to 50. And I'm gonna change my zoom level. I wanna zoom in, so I'm gonna increase it to eight. And I'm gonna press run. Okay, cool. And I didn't already mention this, but this layer that we're seeing is an elevation layer, um, which looks really cool over the mountains here. Up in Canada, I think. Okay, so go ahead and play with that. You can play with the zoom level. You can play with the longitude, latitude and press run. And so that's really all it is. Super easy, you're just modifying a script. Um, I just wanna make sure I, oh, I wanted to mention that this period here just is indicating to you, it's a common pattern in JavaScript. It's just indicating that this function is acting on the map. So in this case, we're changing something about the map. And we'll do that again later when we add a layer to the map. Um, okay. We're gonna mess with this next line, the map.addLayer line, 
And then I'll pause for questions and we'll make sure that all this makes sense to folks. Okay, so map.addLayer is sort of weird function. It's a little complicated or confusing at first, but you're gonna be using it all the time. So it's worth diving in a bit. The first parameter that this function requires, and I'm sorry, I say input parameter, I'm using those all um, interchangeably. But you can see if we're using map.addLayer and we're pressing control space again to get this pop-up. So it's gonna take any type of, whoop, any type of object. So in this case, an image, you could also add a feature to the map. It's then gonna optionally allow you to specify visualization parameters, a name for the layer, true or false, whether or not it's shown on the map and a transparency or opacity, opacity, it's a weird word, uh, level from zero to one. Okay, so essentially we're saying add this image to the map. Visualization parameters are kind of funky. They're always included in these curly brackets and you set different values equal to different um, things. So you would say set the minimum value to, to zero. This is saying set the maximum value to 3000 and then stretch the image um, from white to black between those values. And then we're naming it the Shuttle Radar Topography Missions acronym. That's the name of the data set. Okay. Oh, and I, there is something in the chat. The range for the zoom. This is a great question, Dorothy. The zoom level ranges from zero to 24, or maybe one to 24, with 24 being very zoomed in and one being the you know whole globe. Um, let's test that actually. Is zero a value? There you go. Yeah, ranges to zero. Okay. Let's see what I wanted to do next. Oh, I wanted to show you the layers tab in the map. So the layers tab is your legend. This will disappear when you use, um, mouse away from it. And so if you wanted to keep it there, you can just press this lock button. I frequently do that. And you can check it on and off. You can change the transparency with this little slider. Um, and there's more advanced options if you press, press this little cog. Um, a cool thing, you saw that fourth optional parameter called shown, you can set it to true or false. So I'll do that now. I'll just say, set it to false and change my zoom level back. I'm gonna hit run. And so you can see that it's available as a layer, but it's not checked on. And that can be really nice. We'll do that later when we've added a bunch of layers and it's taking forever to load. We'll use the, this false parameter to make sure that we don't um, auto load too many things onto the map and slow ourselves down. Okay, I think that's all that we that I wanted to say in this in this initiation to JavaScript and using the example scripts. I really encourage you to explore these. They're so cool. And the last thing I'll say on this is that you can filter scripts. So say I wanted to um, filter for something that worked with climate data. It would filter my scripts, but it would also show you, here's some really cool example scripts using climate data. So this is, I'm always searching up here for data sets, and then I'm searching in the scripts manager for examples using those data. Okay, are, what, are, what are our questions? Are we feeling good about JavaScript? Just we're modifying existing scripts. It shouldn't be uh, too intimidating yet, but it's okay if um, things don't make sense and I'd love your questions. One question from Dorothy, what is the range of the zoom? Oh, um, zero to 24, zero being fully zoomed out to the globe, 24 being the most zoomed in the map will go. Great questions. Okay. Is, oh, one more question popped in. Is map add layer for the height? Yes, that's exactly right. So the, the data set that we're importing is an elevation data set. So it's a, it's a raster or image data set giving us the elevation at each point. And this is a great opportunity if you've still got this example script open, you could click the inspector tool, click on a point, and you'll see not only the, that other information that we saw before, but we'll see now elevation values at each point. So super cool data set. This is here for you too. Does that, does that answer the question? 
So you There's designate your map. But, oh, just one comment to the previous ad layer. It doesn't necessarily have to pertain to height. It can be other images, of course, but go ahead from it. Yes, definitely. And to the, to the other question, we're using two separate functions. So this first one is just centering the map on a given point, but you'll notice we're adding an image that covers the entire world. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter where we center the map. This is so cool about Earth Engine. We can zoom anywhere and it will load that imagery that we've um, loaded here. So map.add layer is just adding an image and we, it's kind of clunky. You have to use other tools to center the map, um, either using coordinates or we'll go through an example of centering the map on a given point, which can be really valuable too. Okay, so now I'm going to not save my changes to this. You could save the script to your uh, repository or home folder if you really like it, but it's always there in your example scripts. So for now, I'm gonna go back to my, the script that I started with you all. I'm gonna abandon my changes. And I'm back here to the script that I uh, was editing before. And so if you saved that, this example script, um, if you saved a script that you printed hello world in, it should be in your owner folder, in your default folder. Awesome. Okay, let's keep going for five, 10 more minutes before a bio break. We're going to do some exciting stuff here in step three and probably take a break in the middle of step three. So at this point, um, you're all pros, not getting a lot of questions here, which is fine. Um, you can feel free to follow along and write your own code from scratch, which I'll be doing here. Um, there'll be a lot of copy and pasting from the worksheet, and so that's okay. You don't have to type out all these numbers and letters. You know, it's okay to copy and paste. That's still really valuable or you could work off of the workshop script that we shared and that you already have open. Um, and so you might have saved that to your repository already, or you, could, you should be able to find it um, by clicking that link from earlier and finding it under your reader folder. So I might not be explaining that really well, please jump in if that doesn't make sense. But if you wanna work from scratch, um, you'll be back in a new script, one that you saved earlier. Okay. Oh, what, one comment, Annie, if okay. you toggle be if you toggle between your script and the script that you're working on, on your own pace, you must save them before you switch. So you don't lose one or the other. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Sean, because Google Earth Engine is not like a cool Google Doc that saves every two seconds. You have to hit save after every change you make. So um, frequently what I do is I'll press save and then run just as a habit to make sure that my work's always being saved. That's a really great reminder. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that if I make some change, you'll see the star up here. And if I zoom out, you'll see there's that star here too. That's an indication from Earth Engine to you that your current work has not been saved. Okay. We're going to get into it. We're going to work with some Sentinel data um, and check out this area that we were discussing earlier, the SF rec. So let's grab our imagery data first. To do that, we're going to search for these data by typing Sentinel. Oh, I'm in the search bar, I should say, at the top. I'm going to type Sentinel, which I never spell correctly, to. That's specifying the satellite mission specifically. And then in I'm going to type SR. This is to help filter our options to surface reflectance imagery. Um, it's okay if surface reflectance doesn't mean anything to you, um, but that's, the, that's going to represent the reflectance of the Earth's surface. And so we'd like to use those data. And I'm going to click on this, um, Sentinel-2 MSI level 2A. And I'll see this amazing pop-up with tons of information about this data set. There's a description. I can also click Band. So if you're familiar with imagery data, you might like to use this band um, tab in order to understand which bands correspond to which types of light and a bunch of other, you know, citation in terms of use. This is the part of this pop-up that we're most interested in, the collection snippet in the lower left. 
this is the information ID to import this data into our script. So I'm going to click copy right next to the collection snippet. And then I'm going to go down to the lower right and click close. Okay. I'm going to delete hello world and I'll add a comment that we're importing SENL to imagery. So to import imagery, first, if you remember this, I'd be very surprised. We're going to type var. That's telling Earth Engine this is a new data set, a new object. We're going to name it S2SR to remind ourselves this is Sentinel 2 surface reflectance. We're going to hit equals and then simple as pasting that collection snippet and then adding a semicolon on the end. Okay, you can also be copying and pasting from our uh, worksheet. Okay, so this is great, but this is representing all the Sentinel-2 service reflectance data ever captured. And so to keep our scripts from taking so long to run, I'm going to filter this, this uh, imagery data set by date, just to two years of its um, roughly six year, five year history. So to do that, we're gonna use a tool called filter date. So you'll add that dot, which means apply the tool I'm about to tell you about to this object, which is the imagery collection. And I'll type filter, all lowercase, uppercase D, date, and those parentheses. So dates in Earth Engine are text or string objects. And in this case, so I'm gonna press that single quotes, I'm gonna say from 2019, and then I'm going to filter it on the other end to 2021. Just to note that the filter date tool is has an exclusive endpoint, so I won't, I'm excluding any imagery captured in 2021. So just have two years of, of data. Okay, I'm gonna hit save and check the chat. Earth Engine has, oh, this is a great question from Chippy. Earth Engine has Sentinel-2 surface reflectance imagery all the way back to 2015. In general, they tried to um, ingest or upload the entire archives that are available for each of these satellites. Really, really impressive. Okay, great. So we've just created a new variable for our Sentinel imagery. Oh, we're getting a lot of chats. Oh. Great questions. So they have applied an atmospheric correction um, algorithm to surface reflectance imagery in Earth Engine, but you still might um, want to run a manual correction or some other form of correction. It's sort of, uh, it's not perfect, but they, it's, it's been initially corrected for atmospheric influence. That's okay. If, if this doesn't mean anything to you, that's totally fine. Um, level 2A, yeah, I actually don't know about, sometimes these level 2A or level 1C mean the amount of correction and calibration that's un been undergone for that imagery. And so that could be true that they haven't been able to correct all the way back to 2015. Now to Dorothy's question, yes, that's exactly right. So we're starting at January 1, 2019, um, when we say, Take, give us you know, any imagery in 2019. So that's gonna start at the first of the year. But in fact, it's not going to go until December 31st, 2021. It's gonna take us to all imagery taken up until 2021. And so this would be, um, I'm just gonna write this out visually because I feel like I'm talking in circles. I'm so sorry. Jan 1, 2019 to December 31, 2020. So this is just two years of imagery. And Sean posted some information about Sentinel data in Earth Engine. Yes, Ludovica is already using control space to figure out what's going on with each of these tools. So if I hit control space, I can get more information about um, how this tool functions. Okay, great questions. This is already getting exciting. Okay. So now we're going to add this to the map. We wanna check it out. It's pretty boring just to have it as a variable. So to do that, I'm going to use, I'm gonna say add imagery to the map and I'll say map uppercase M 
dot add uppercase L layer. And the object I want to add to the map is that image collection. So this is many images and it'll just add a recent mosaic of those images. Um, in terms of those visualization parameters, those are going to be in those curly brackets. And in this case, we're going to use the same visualization parameters we saw in that example script. We're just setting the min minimum value to zero and the maximum value to 3000. This is optional. You don't have to do this. And you can see I'm not always consistent about adding spaces. JavaScript doesn't care about your spaces. So don't be afraid to make, make it look ugly. And then I'll say this is Sentinel to imagery. OK, add a semicolon, hit save, and hit run. I'm actually going to zoom in because Earth Engine can take a long time to load in some cases if you're zooming out to the whole globe, particularly when we're adding many different images. Oh, great. So Chippy updated us. The surface reflectance corrected Sentinel imagery only goes back to 2017 right now. Maybe they're working on that. Maybe we need to get on them to work on that. But uh, that's really good information. Okay. So I've added this imagery to the map, but it's looking super weird. Why is it blue? That's in part because we're looking at bands of the imagery that are um, capturing aerosol values in blue light rather than typically how our eyes would interpret things, which is using red, blue, and green channels. So in, in Earth Engine, we have to specify, just like in many GIS softwares, they're, they're going to say, what's in the, what should we show as red? What should we show as green? What should we show as blue? So we have to set those band values or channel values uh, manually. So to do that, we're going to, I'm actually going to copy this and modify it. I'm going to say add true color imagery to the map. And then I'll change the layer name, say true color. It's getting a little long. Um, and I'll add a visualization parameter to set the band values. So to do that, I'm going to set bands. And the bands parameter is a list of band names. So in this case, the red band is band four. It's OK not to know that. Um, you can always find that by, by searching the data set here. The green band is band three. The blue band is band two. Just going to quickly check my work. I did that well. OK. Got the semicolon on the end. And I'm going to hit run and save. I'm going to check this off because it's slowing me down. And I'll just set this to false so that it doesn't auto turn on every time. All right, so it's starting to load. And you can see this looks like something that we would interpret visually with our eyes. It's not creepy in blue or green. It's sort of those natural tones that we would expect. OK, great. How are folks doing with this so far? Got a thumbs up. OK, so now I'm on step, we're step 3.2b. And that's on page 7 of the worksheet. So now that we've created this image collection, it's huge. This is covering the globe for two years, um, and it's slowing us down a little bit. It's a pretty broad image collection. So we're going to next filter this image collection to our study area so that we're not loading this global data set every time we press run. So to do that, on step 3 to B, you're going to copy and paste some coordinates into the search bar. And that'll take us to the SFREC study area. So I'm just copying and pasting. And you'll see when I paste the coordinates, I see it pop up under places. And I'm just going to click that point, and boom, the map flies me over to the SFREC area. Check the chat. 
Great point, Sean. If, if your computer is taking forever to load, zooming in will always help Earth Engine. Um, it has to load fewer tiles in most cases. I don't even know why it works actually, but it just works, it helps me. Okay, great. So we're in our study area. Oh, a little chat. Oh, didn't follow that part. So I was, I think you're referring to my brief aside on zooming in. Basically, if your script is taking a long time to run in a given area, sometimes I'll zoom in so that there are fewer tiles or pixels of the image that has to load. So let me know if that makes sense. Okay, great. This is a pretty awesome milestone. You've added imagery to your map and it looks like it would to our naked eye. So I think right now we're gonna take a brief bio break and try to come back at 2.18. So in eight minutes from now, if you're in a different time zone. Okay. Great, I'm actually gonna to run to the bathroom myself, but if I'm back before 2.18, I'll just hop on and answer any questions um, that you might have. Okay, great, and I'll leave up my screen share as well. Sean, is that okay if I dip out? Oh yeah, absolutely. If anyone has any questions that I can help with too, I'm here. Awesome, Sean's here. Okay, I'll be right back. Sean, David Lewis. Hey, David, how you doing? Oh, having fun on a Friday. This is a great way to do Friday. <laughs> right. Um, all right, so I do have a very basic question and everyone's gonna roll their eyes, but um, where did she get the Latin lawn for going to the rack that she cut and pasted in? I mean, I could type it in, oh, but I, I missed that stuff. It's, it's, it's in the exercise. I'd have to look to see the precise okay. location in the exercise. So it's in one of that page. It's in one of those. I see it now. Okay. Yeah, I found it. There I you found go. It. Okay. Okay. Yep. That, that sounds works. good. That works. Cool. In fact, this is probably a good time. I could show the trick that I was speaking of earlier where you can set the script up to your to the side where it's already complete and then refer to it. Y'all wait till Annie gets back for that. All right, so I'm back. If anyone has questions during the break, I hope you're taking a stretch, getting refreshed. Things are about to heat up a little bit, so. For, for anyone that's sitting here looking at the computers right now, I can show what I was speaking about with setting the script up to the side for reference that I mentioned earlier that probably wasn't really clear because it doesn't make sense unless you're looking at it. <laughs> So this is what I was referring to. If you bring up the your your script from the link provided earlier, and you copy Control C, and then have some kind of text editor, and you can paste it in there. What's really nice is then when we refer to the exercise itself, and which I closed on accident. The nice thing is, as you go through here, Annie has very uh, nicely laid out the location within the within the exercise of each of the steps. So through in section two, step three E, 
here's the what's going on step in three one uh, C here is the here's the comment what is going on and then followed by the script so if you have to you can copy and paste this into your into your own script editor or your own session and and it's pretty handy so if you have a problem at any given section the information is already there for you That looks awesome. And that's a great point. I forgot to mention if you're working out of the workshop script that yes, the all of the letters and numbers match up or they should. They do. <laughs> I check. They're great. So Krista is asking about the this is not a function error. This is so common. This happens to all of us. And typically for me, what's most likely the cause is that I've um, I'll share my screen. The cause might be that I've mis mistaken the casing, the upper or lower case of one of the letters. So it's really sensitive. So if I type map.add layer and the L is lowercase and I try to run this script, then it's going to let me know that that's not a function and where it is in my script. So let us know if that solves your problem. And that's totally relatable. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, for me, it's usually a case of um, if I'm working for a specific with a specific area of interest, and I'm attempting to do the mad the map dot add layer, um, and then the variable, and then crop it to that area. There's usually some piece of code that I'm missing, and I've gone back and tried to pull from existing codes. Um, to turn it into a function, but I was just wondering, it's not quite ingrained in my brain yet. So I was wondering if you had some pointers for that or if that might come up later today. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I totally grasp your question, but would this be something like, and it's okay, this is not part of the workshop for folks who are like, what's happening. If I wanted to like clip this to some region, something like this, yeah, exactly. Okay. And and I've defined, you know, AOI and then as an earlier variable. I have I have all that, but first there's and and this is why I guess I'm asking is I just don't know what I'm doing wrong that I end up with those errors part way through because I feel like I've taken those initial steps. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. That'd be that'd be an interesting question. Maybe at the next break you could uh share your screen or I'm going to stay on after the workshop ends and we could we could troubleshoot that definitely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, awesome. It's 218. Everybody get a last stretch in. We're about to do some fun stuff in Earth Engine. Do people feel ready to go back back at their computers? Okay, seeing some thumbs up. Great. So like I said, we have a global data set and our next step is gonna to be to filter it to this area to our study site. So there are two ways to get an area into an Earth Engine script. The first is to use drawing tools and I'll provide some background on how you might do that um, in a later step. The next is to, or the second way to add a feature in Earth Engine is to just specify coordinates. So we're gonna do that. So I encourage you, instead of typing out a million numbers, to go to the worksheet, we're at step 3.2B, or no, 3.2C, and I'm gonna copy and paste the code that, sh that um, creates a new point called SFREC. So I'm just pasting this in, make this a little bit easier to see. Okay. So what you're seeing here is a function that builds a geometry from point um, longitude and latitude coordinates here. And I'm gonna ignore this message about import an import record. We're not gonna use imports today, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, we're gonna talk about that in, at the next step when we draw some rectangles. Okay, so just copy and pasted this in, that'll create a new point and assign it to a variable called sfrec. And now we're able to filter Sentinel-2 images to this point. So I'm gonna write some new code here. Let me make my map a little smaller. 
So filter Sentinel-2 imagery to a point. So I'm gonna create a new image collection. <laughs> You're probably seeing a pattern here. Sentinel-2 surface reluctance, and I'm gonna call this SF rec to remind myself that it's filtered spatially. I'm gonna set this equal to S2SR. So it's the same as our old image collection, except we want to filter bounds. This is a really cool tool that acts on an image collection to filter it to a given point or line or polygon on, um, on Earth. So in this case, our point is called SFREC. I'm gonna toss a semicolon onto the end of that line. Okay, great work. Finally, I think, did I wanna, oh great. First, we're gonna print this image collection. This is sort of gonna be our working image collection from here on out, this S2 SRS of rec, which is a lot to say. I'm gonna print this image collection to the console. And I'll show you why we, you might be doing this and why it's valuable to print something, not just to the map, but to our console. So to do that, I'm gonna say print, just like we did in our first line ever of JavaScript, and then type the name of the object. In this case, S2 SRS FREC. Put a semicolon on that. I don't see any errors coming up. I'm gonna hit save and run. So you can see our true color imagery is loading. And in our console, we now see the image collection printed. I'm gonna make this really big so that uh, we can read it all. So this has 145 images in the collection. You can see this collection as a whole has some properties, things like the date range, which doesn't look like something I can read or understand, description of the imagery, that type of thing. If you expand the features list, you're going to see the individual images, all 145 of them here in your console. And that's really valuable. You can get a sense of um, when they were taken. Most image IDs have a pretty readable date at their start. So you can see this is from uh, January 5th, 2019. And you get a sense of how many images you're working with. So printing to the console, always a good idea. Highly recommend that step. But we wanna see it on the map. It's not going to look different from our uh, previous image collections. It's just going to load faster. It's for a smaller area. So in order to do that, why don't you practice copying and pasting code you've already written, which is a great way to save time. So I'm copying lines eight and nine in my script that add the true color imagery to the map. I'm gonna paste those down. There are a couple things I wanna change. So first, I want to, instead of doing the global data set, I want the SFREC filter data set. I like these visualization parameters, but I'm going to name it, give the layer name um, a different name to remind myself what this is. So Sentinel-2 SFREC or any other name that helps you remember. Okay, I'm gonna hit save and run. Y'all are doing great. I'm gonna turn off the global data set and you'll see this data should load a little bit faster. So that's something you can do to speed up your analysis. Great. So, and you can always zoom out to, to see where sort of the edges of your Sentinel image are. Pretty, pretty far. And you can see there's some snow here in the mountains and some clouds here on the left side of the image. So that's what we'll tackle in the next step. But for now, let's clean up some of this, this uh, code before we move on to step four. We're flying through this workshop, you're doing great. Um, first, you noticed that I added this parameter false. That's to make sure that it's checked off. Um, I don't want both of these global data sets loading every time I press run. So you can set the fourth parameter in map.addLayer to false for any layers you don't want to be checked on. And I'm actually gonna do that for this uh, Sentinel true color imagery too. Just gonna put a comma and then type false. And if I spell it right, it turns bold. So that's defaulting to true, but um, if you don't wanna check it on, you do have to specify that. Okay, is there anything else I wanted to clean up? Another thing is if you didn't want this uh, layer to load at all, even unchecked on your script, you can use those two forward slashes and comment out that information. Okay, great. 
Is there anything else you wanted to clean up before we move forward? Oh yeah, we're gonna center our map on this SFREC point. And that's a way that every time I hit run, right now, if I hit run, I'd still be zoomed out. And that's kind of annoying. I wanna be automatically focused on my study site. So to do that, we're going to center our map on the study site. And we saw um, map.setCenter in the, in the example script, which uses latitude and longitude. We're gonna use map.center which, as you might guess, centers the map on an object rather than coordinates. So our point object is SF ref, and you still have the option to specify a zoom level. So I can't remember what I said in the example script, but I'll say 12. Save, run. Looks like I said 15. Okay, no questions coming up. But where is that point in space? This is another thing I do often when I'm cleaning up a script or just getting started. I wanna add all of my feature data to the map as well. So not just the imagery, but also the point data. And so to do that, um, we're gonna say add point to map. And excitingly, it uses the same function as uh, imagery data, map.addLayer. And I'm gonna add my object in this case is SFREC. My visualization parameters in curly brackets. This looks different for every type of object you add to a map. So you saw if you have multi-band imagery, you'll be specifying the stretch value and the band values. But with an object, we only get one visualization parameter and that's color. Oops, I'm gonna say color, colon. Um, I'll say white. You can also use hex codes. We'll see examples of hex codes to specify colors later, but for now you can just use any common color name in quotes there. And then I'll add a comma to add the layer name. So I think I named this analysis point. Throw on a semicolon, save, run. Awesome. So you'll see now on my map, I can see that little point pop up. I can check it on and off. Super cool. And I've got my imagery for SFREC checked on automatically, and these two are just off by default. The last thing we're gonna do, if you check off your imagery data, you'll see that there's a base map provided by Google underneath. And you can toggle between that roadmap and the satellite map using these buttons in the, in the right, or you can set it in your script. So this is something I'll do often as well. I think it's map.set options, again, with the weird casing. And you have a number of different options. So you can say satellite, you could set it to roadmap, like we just saw. You could also set it to hybrid or terrain. Um, so I've included those options in the worksheet, but I'll say for now, satellite. And let's pray that I spelled satellite correctly. I'll add a comment for setting my base map. Save and run. And it looks like it did spell it correctly. You'll see the satellite option um, is automatically loading. Okay, we're looking really good. We're starting to uh, really be getting there for the analysis phase. As you can see, there's some um, setup and pre-processing of your script, but you'll be copying and pasting this type of setup again and again. So this is really the last time you got to write it out. Uh, you know, from here on out, we'll just be editing it. Any questions before we move on to step four? Got a thumbs up from Chippy, consistently thumbs up in. I don't think Zoom lets you thumbs down though, so. Okay, great. Step four, this is our last sort of more boring processing step. And then we're basically just going to be throwing at you all of our favorite tools that we think are the most interesting, useful, and commonly uh, incorporated. So this is our last annoying thing. Um, it's kind of a black boxy step, and then we'll get into some fun stuff. So we're on step four of the worksheet, which is page eight. And this is cloud filtering. 
So many imagery data sets, including Sentinel, have, um, I'll just show you Sentinel-2, SR, this is the data set we're using. Many of them have spectral bands with information about different types of light. And then they also have a quality assurance band. Here they have a quality assurance cloud mask band that we're gonna be using to mask out pixels that are likely to contain clouds. These quality assurance bands are not perfect. And so there are these really complicated cloud masking algorithms that do a great job. And um, I provided a link to a more advanced version of this. We're just gonna do this basic first filter to say, if the quality assurance cloud mask says it's likely to have clouds, we don't want that pixel. We're not throwing out the whole image, we're just throwing out the pixel. Okay. Monitor the chat. Ooh, smoke is a great question. You know, I don't know if there are pre-made smoke masks in, you know, where the, the quality assurance band contains information about smoke. I actually don't know um, whether or not Landsat or Sentinel imagery has that built in, but I do know there's probably someone who's written a function to um, classify the likelihood of smoke in a given pixel. I bet someone's done the, the homework to figure that out. So we, we could totally explore that. Okay, great. So with that background, um, we're gonna be using that QA60 quality assurance cloud mask band. And it's kind of a pain. The cloud uh, masking function is pretty long. It's a couple lines of code. We don't need to be writing a cloud mask function. We're just gonna copy and paste this already written function that I found in an example script. So if you're on page eight and you're on step three, one B, you'll be able to copy and paste that over. I'll do that now. I'm using return to create new lines to keep going in my script, press paste. Okay, so you can see um, there's some stuff about QA60. It's kind of confusing, we don't care. I'm gonna show you how to apply the cloud mask function to our existing data set. So to do this, we have to use what's called the map function. This is arguably a really poor name um, based on the, the Earth Engine API designers. There's the map, uppercase M, which is this object here. And there's a function map, lowercase, that essentially takes some type of function in the parentheses and applies it to every image in a collection or every feature in a collection. So it's a way to map over a collection of images or features. Okay, so that's confusing. I don't know who was in charge of that, but uh, we're gonna work with it. Okay, so now I'm gonna write some code to map over our image collection, this cloud mask function. And I should say, um, I'm sorry to mention this before. There are these pre-made functions like add layer or there's the option to define your own. So in this case, someone wrote a function to cloud mask sentinel imagery. You can write a function that, you know, adds one plus one. You can do all of that. Um, you don't have, you're not limited to the functions that are already existing in Earth Engine. Um, and so that's sort of more advanced, but just know that that's an option and that's what we're doing here. We're, we're writing our own function and then applying it. Okay, so map cloud mask function over our imagery. To do that, I'm gonna create a new variable, starting to get super long, S2SR, SFREC, I'm gonna call this mask. And it's gonna be set equal to our previous, um, our Sentinel-2 imagery filtered to SFREC. So that's, we made that up here. And we're gonna say, okay, take that image collection and map over each image in the collection, this function cloud mask, throw in a semicolon. All right, that's kinda, kind of clunky. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Awesome. Okay, cool. So we've created a cloud masked um, image collection, but we want to check it out. We want to add it to the map. Ooh, 
question from Stuart. Is there a built-in ee.cloudmask function or do we need to define our own cloud mask function? This is a great question. So there's, um, you know, let's just answer this right now. If there are any pre-written cloud masking algorithms, looks like there are a few pre-written ones, but as you can see, they all are specific to um, types of imagery. So you need a different cloud mask function to filter clouds out of Landsat 8, then out of Landsat 5, then out of Sentinel 2. And so each one, um, oops, each one takes its own uh, quality assurance band information and, and process it differently. So I hope that answers your question. That's kind of why we have to write it out for each one. Okay, we're gonna add this to the map. Some of you are pros and won't even need to look up here. Basically, I'm going to copy and paste um, my most recent add to map Sentinel imagery, which is for me is line 20. It's when I added um, the Sentinel to SF rec layer, I'll copy that, paste it down. I'm gonna change, I'm gonna say add cloud mask imagery to the map. I'm gonna change the object to be that masked image collection we made. I'm gonna change the max to 2000. I like to brighten it up a little bit. And I'll say, I'll change the layer name. So I just had to edit a few words in that line. You've already written so much code so you can just work off of it and use it. And just like that, we've got our Sentinel-2 cloud masked imagery collection two years of imagery at our study site, very few cloudy pixels left in this data set. That's an awesome accomplishment. And now I would call this data set analysis ready, which is exactly what we're gonna do in step five. So are there any questions on any of this? I'm going to turn this previous collection to false, this cloudy collection back here, hit save. That way I'm not loading more than one image at a time. Awesome. Moving on, we're gonna take this analysis ready data set and use it to calculate NDVI and then graph changes in NDVI over time. Um, and so Maggie gave a great overview of NDVI. Again, we're just gonna be identifying areas with healthy green vegetation on the landscape. So as you recall from our great earlier lesson, let me check in the chat. Oh, how would we find an image for a particular date? This is a great question. There's actually an example that, I, that we work through at the very end of the workshop that does this. So I'm gonna save that question. We will filter for a particular date. And then David's question, when you, do map.add layer for a collection. This is a great point. It will display, I'm quoting them here, a recent a mosaic of recent values. So say for example, the most recent image had some missing values or you filtered out certain cloudy pixels, it would mosaic using um, the most recent pixels available in your image collection. Great point. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to next write a function that adds NDVI as a calculation to our image collection. So we've got a red band, a near infrared band, a green band, a blue band. We're just gonna add an NDVI band onto our image collection. And to do that, you're going to go to, we're at step five, one B. And this is another case in which I kind of just recommend you copy and paste. This is an existing function um, that calculates NDVI and adds it to a Sentinel-2 image. So in this case, the function is called add NDVI. And you can see actually these are using two different function constructors. They look a little different. Both of these syntaxes work to define a new tool or a function. So we're calling it add NDVI. It takes an image. It takes the normalized difference between the near infrared and the red band and it names that band NDVI so that we know what we're, um, what we're working with. And then we'll add that NDVI band to our image, which it outputs. Awesome. 
I think you know what we have to do? Very similar to the cloud masking, we have to now map this over our whole image collection. So once again, this function works on one image, we wanna do it for the whole collection. So to do that, let's say map add NDVI over the whole image collection. I'll say var, creating a new um, variable, renaming this Sentinel to NDVI because we got tired of having all the reminders of what it was. Sentinel to NDVI is equal to. This is our last time having to type out that super long variable name S2SR, SFREC, mask. And if you want to try to guess um, how to map the function based on our previous line of code, you can go ahead and do that. I won't give it away if you're not looking at my screen. You're already becoming a pro, clearly. So I, I basically typed dot map and in the parentheses add in DBI. Threw that semicolon on. Okay. So now we've added NDVI to our image collection, um, but that's not totally interesting yet. We wanna chart NDVI over time. Um, and to do that, I'll show you one of my favorite things to do in Earth Engine, which is to create and print charts. I think this is a secret superpower of this tool. Um, and so we really wanted to show it off to you all. Okay, so now I'm on step 5.2.8. On page 10. Okay. So you this you might be copying and pasting at this point because it's starting to get a little complicated in, in step five, but it's great if you're gonna be typing from scratch with me. So I'm gonna say uh, chart NDVI over time at a point. To do that, I'm gonna create a new variable. It's gonna be called chart. You can be more creative if you would like. And the function to create a chart is ui.chart. And then there are a bunch of different sub functions you can use. In this case, we're gonna use one called image.image.series. This is a long function name. Sorry about that. It's worth it. Uh, you'll see in a moment. Okay, what does this function take? I'm going to press control space. And actually, yeah, if you don't have anything written in it yet, it'll annoyingly spit out all of the options that you need. If you already have something written and you hit control space, you'll get the pop up. Okay, so it's gonna take an image collection and then a region at which to chart those, that image collection over time. We're not gonna worry about these others yet. I'm gonna delete that and say, okay, my image collection is S2 NDVI. I only want to look at the NDVI band. So in this case, I'm gonna say select, which just means take a subset of bands. And in this case, I just wanna select the NDVI band. I'm wondering if you need that the list. Yeah, you don't need the list if it's just one band. Sorry about that. Just try to keep it simple. So I'm selecting the NDVI band from that our image collection we just made. And then my point is still SF rec. Okay, great. We created a chart object, fabulous. Now if you're gonna go, if you wanna make your chart fancy, we wanted to show you how to do that. So in step two or 5.2.C, you can copy and paste some chart options. So we're just showing you how to set the custom options for your chart. Maybe you wanna change the title or the x-axis the y-axis name, which they call H and B, and then maybe set the, the series color. So you'll see what all that looks like in a moment, but this is just how to change and play with those chart options. There's a lot more that's possible and I provided a link to that in the worksheet. All right. The last thing we need to do is set the chart options. So right now we have a chart object, we have an options object, we're gonna get them to speak to each other. So we're gonna say chart, equals, I'm not putting var because I'm not creating a new variable, I'm updating our existing chart variable to say chart equals chart, except set the options to options. <laughs> really creative variable naming going on here. And now we're gonna print the chart. And you'll get to see what all of your hard work has come to. So 
save and run. I'm gonna make my console a little bigger. Super cool. So we're seeing a, um, the NDVI values at this point. So remember where a little point is over time across our whole image collection. Um, you can see some points are filtered out. So you're seeing these gaps between points. That's probably due to clouds that we filtered out. And you can see this curve looks really great, except for this point here, June 14th, 2019. And that's where we'll get to play with filtering a given image at the end of the workshop. Because um, yeah, that's just not realistic. We didn't, we didn't see that, you know, grass green up all the way to the maximum value of NDVI and then come back down. That's probably a mistake. Okay, and this makes sense in California. We see that, um, I'm gonna actually pop this chart open so we get a bigger view. I'm gonna press this button in the upper right to expand my Earth Engine chart. And we get a better idea like, okay, so this is um, March, April, May is when we see those high values of NDVI. That would make sense for grassland that's greening up and becoming healthier in response to spring and winter rain. And then we see throughout the summer and fall that NDVI declines. And that's probably due to grassland um, becoming senescent or dried out. And we would expect to see that. Cool feature here, this is why I love the charts. You can download these data as um, table data and work with them in R or Python or anything. You know, just work with them in Excel. That's all available to you. And it's a really powerful way to get um, temporal information. Okay, I'm just going to make sure I didn't miss anything I wanted to say on this point. No, nope. any questions so far? It's about to get crazy. We're about to graph changes in NDVI between two different areas on the same chart. So I want to make sure everyone knows what we've done so far. Fairly advanced crew. All Can right. I ask a quick question, Annie? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, if you were using different imagery like Landsat or something, how would calculating in DVI be different? Would it be selecting different bands or could we use a similar function like we used? That's a great question. Such a good point. Everything in our add NDVI function would be the exact same, except in this case, just like you mentioned, um, the near infrared and red bands would be different. So for, let's look at Landsat 8, surface reflectance imagery. I would come over here and look at the bands and I'd say, okay, I'm gonna use band five and band four. So that's, that's sort of how it would change. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah, great question. I, I hope that y'all get to adapt this script to do whatever you need it to do. Um, we're, that's the goal is to just throw a ton of uh, options at you and you can cut and paste these into your future scripts. Okay. So now I'm on, you can see I'm barely keeping track. I'm on step five, three, A. We're gonna graph changes in NDVI between two different areas on the same chart. And this is really amazing. It doesn't sound that cool, but I promise you if you're, if you have a study area, you're comparing area A with area B, it's so interesting to get these charts over time. You're doing a comparison, not only across space, but over time and how those have differed um, through the season. So this is just something I use all the time. I'm excited to show it off and then monitor the chat. Yes, and there's one more question that just popped in oh, there yeah. about why we use the select bracket function. Yeah, that's a great point. Let's just delete that for now, or I'll, you don't delete it on your script, but I'll just show you if we didn't, specify the band, we could just get all of them. It's gonna take a little longer to load. So um, we, just, we just took a subset of the bands in order to make it cleaner. Sentinel comes with tens of bands. Whoa. Yeah, so um, really cool information here, but probably not as valuable as checking out that NDVI band, which is way down here from zero to one. Is that, um, oops. And Maggie makes a good point that it's important to know 
how different satellites have different numbers of bands, what they might mean. That's a great point. I can't keep it straight. I'm constantly going up here to the search bar to check what bands are what. So um, yeah, it's hard to keep, keep it straight. You can also, once you've printed an image or an image collection, um, I'll show you how to just look at the bands. So here we have 23 bands. And it, you know, it's kind of hard to know what these mean, which is why I like to use the, the search bar. But, um, you know, if these meant something to you, then the console has that information too. Okay, great. So for this step, um, step five, three, A, I'm going to copy and paste again um, to define two different boxes. So what this is doing is creating two features, one called grass, which uses some coordinates I created that define a little area of grassland. We're going to label that feature grassland. So we're adding a property called label. Um, and then we're going to do the same with an area that's oak woodland. And we're going to call that oaks. One question in the chat. Oh. Um, okay. So this is, we're going to use this copy and pasted code to create those boxes so that all of our scripts look the same. And I'm going to quickly walk you through what it would look like to just draw your study area on the map because we get a lot of questions about that. Oh, and real quickly, a great question from David. What is the spatial resolution of NDVI? So in this case, um, the Sentinel-2 red band and near infrared bands are both 10 meter spatial resolution. So Earth Engine will be working in that resolution. And if you didn't know that already, which I looked this up you know, yesterday, you can find the resolution of each band here in, in the search bar, which you can tell is my favorite thing. OK, great. So if you wanted to draw two boxes or, or any study area on your map, which you might, you might check off all your information and say, you know, I want to use this high resolution Google base map to create some of my own um, regions, points, or lines. And so the drawing tools are really great for interacting with the map. So in general, I'll show you my workflow, and then I'm going to delete what I do here and just use the code that hard codes those boxes. Okay, so this is what I would do. I would open the map. I would click on um, whatever tool is most important. So if I wanted points, lines, crazy shape polygon, or a rectangle, I'm gonna click rectangle here. You see that I'm now in rectangle drawing mode and you'll just click and drag a study area rectangle onto the map. Um, when you're done drawing, you'll click exit so that you can move around the map again without having to draw. And you'll also notice that this geometry imports Thing has popped up and it's named my polygon geometry. So maybe that's, you know, maybe I don't want it to be red. I want it to name it something else. So I, oh, I'm getting ahead of my own words. I would click this cog, name it something like study site, change the color to yellow. It's kind of a tough yellow, maybe green. And the geometry would have no properties, but if I wanted to add a property like I had um, in the code we wrote, like label, I would say label, and I could say oats, just like we did in um, that copying pasting code. That's okay. There's another place where your drawings will show up, and that's here at the top called imports. Um, so any change you make here, study, site, explanation point. Actually, I don't know if it likes those. I have never tried that. Okay, it doesn't like that. I'll name my thing Annie. And you'll see that it updates down here too. So these are the same thing, those are linked. And if you wanted to send someone the code to make this feature, you press this button here, this blue uh, lined thing and send them this whole chunk. So it's kind of clunky. That's why I like to instead use hard coding like this when possible, because then if I share this script, I can, you know, they can, easily see what boxes I was talking about. I don't have to tell them, draw a box here or you know, add this import code. You can just send them the script. And so that's generally why I avoid imports. And that's what it's trying to remind you to do. It's saying you could convert this feature to an import, a geometry import, 
And I, that's why I press ignore, because I, oh my gosh, yeah, so many warnings. You just can't win. So yeah, so I'll just now um, delete my import by pressing this trash can. And you'll see that the imports banner at the top has gone away and my geometry banner has gone away on the map. Okay, so that was the quick kind of aside on drawing tools. Um, Sean, it looks like someone needs a link to the code. You don't mind dropping that in? Oh, share the code. Yes, I thought it was a general question about how can you share the code that you create? Oh, yes, great point. Whether or not this is the question, to do that, I would go up here to this get link button. So when I press that, I have a couple options. Um, this get link is giving you a snapshot of what my code looks like right now. So that's one option. If you wanted to send like I did, I sent you a link to my script path. So any changes I made, you'd be able to see too. Um, to do that, you would say copy script path. Um, you might, it's, it's hard, you have to change the sharing on that and I'm happy to help anyone who wants to share their scripts that way too. Get link is really quick and easy. Okay. One more thing in the chat. Oh, I think you shared the Sentinel info instead of the workshop script, but I'll keep going. All right, so we walked through the drawing features. We're now on step C. We're gonna add these two features to the map. So this is gonna look the same as it did when we added the point to the map. So in fact, if you wanna test your skills, you can find the line of code. It's a little bit hard to find stuff. Um, Find the line of code where you added your point to the map, copy, paste it. I'm gonna say add areas to the map. Instead of SREC, SFREC, I'm gonna add grass. I'm gonna make this green and I'm gonna call it grassland. I'm gonna copy that line again. You can see the other area we've defined is called oaks. I'm gonna say add oaks to the map, make it blue, and call it oak woodland. Press save and run, and you'll get to see where those boxes are on the landscape. There's my grassland, there's my oak woodland, and that um, appears to be what we're working with in those two areas. You can check them on and off in the layers tab if they are annoying to you. Okay, great. We have a great question from um, Jeffrey in the chat. We're defining two areas using a, a function called bounding box. And so this is taking the, you know, northwest, south, and easternmost points of a box. And that's why we only need four coordinates rather than, you know, a coordinate pair for each point in the box. So that's a great, great question. Okay. Next, we're going to combine these two into one. We right now have two separate features. We're gonna to wanna to put them in one feature collection for this chart that I'm gonna, uh, that we're gonna to get to. So to do that, say combine feature collection. And to do that, we would say, create a new feature collection called, we're gonna call this features. And you'll see this really interesting um, function called ee.featurecollection, which is basically saying, take whatever I'm about to give you and create a feature collection out of it. So I'll make a list using those um, boxy brackets probably the official name, and I'll say grass and oats, combine those into one feature collection, throw a semicolon on the end. Okay. And now all we have left is to create a comparison chart that takes these two features in a feature collection and graphs their NDVI value over time for a whole image collection. Super exciting. Like I said, this is a tool I use all the time, and I think you'll really like it. So feel free to copy and paste because this, this code is kind of long. Um, this is step five, 
three E. So I'm gonna copy and paste, Just give myself a little bit of time. And let's talk through what's happening here. So this is a um, function called UI dot chart dot image series by region. So this is saying, um, don't just chart an image series over time or an image collection over time, do it by a number of different regions. I don't know the limit on the number of regions, but I have not found it yet. It's a really useful tool. So again, like with our other chart, we're just calling this one comparison chart or comp chart. We're gonna give it the image collection. We have to, um, the parameters are a little different here. It's a different function. So we can see it needs an image collection. It needs the feature collection with the regions. It's also asking us for the reducer. So it's not important to get too hung up on what reducers are, but you can see here we've chosen reducer.mean. There are a bunch of options like maximum value, minimum value within these, each of these boxes. We're taking the mean and DVI value within each of these boxes over time. So there are a bunch of different options for reducers and I've included more info on that in the worksheet. And then we're specifying the band, in this case, the scale, the um, X property, which is just gonna be over time on the X axis, just like with our previous chart and the series property, which in this case is our label property. So that's why it looks a little longer. We used, you know, a lot of these that would have been used time by default, but we had to set that parameter in order to set that final parameter. Uh, there's ways to set a subset of parameters but we're not gonna get into that today. Okay, great. Again, we're gonna assign chart options. This could be fun to do, to try um, if you remember how we set chart options above. So maybe you don't look at what I'm doing and, and try this out on your own. So I'm gonna say comp chart equals comp chart dot set options. Set those options to options. And then I'll print the chart, print comp chart, semicolon. All right, you're about to see what I'm talking about. Probably been kind of abstract up until this point. Super cool result. <laughs> Chippy with the party hat. Um, I'm gonna expand this chart using that expand button in the right of the chart. And you can see this looks so interesting. So we're seeing NDVI change over time between an oak woodland and a grassland area. And you can see we've got these really intense swings in the grassland, they're browning out way more. Whereas just as we'd expect, these oaks are kind of um, greening up and browning out a little bit less drastically. They're keeping their foliage. Um, whereas this is you know, a brown field of dead grass. These are oaks that might be water stressed or have less new foliage, but they're still green. So that's a really cool result. And you can imagine how how easy it is to compare different study areas over time and you get this really cool seasonal view. So we thought this, this tool was awesome. We wanted to share it. Um, and like I said, we used the mean NDVI within each of those boxes over time, but we could have also looked at the sum or the standard deviation within that box. There's a, there's a ton of different reducers and you can look in the docs tab to check that out. Okay, I think this is super cool. I use this all the time. I would love to answer questions on this or just hear your ideas of how to use this uh, tool. And again, you can export that CSV by going to that expand button and then clicking download CSV. So I'll just do that now. I'm gonna click expand here, download CSV. Okay. Awesome, I think, I think we're ready for step six. It probably also makes sense to give you another eight minute break uh, since we're at the hour and we're doing really great on time. So why don't we take a break now until 3.12? You can stretch, use the bathroom, get some water, whatever you need. And I'll, I'll stay here and answer questions. But yeah, no, no workshop will happen until 3.12. So we'll see you all back here soon.
Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question. Do you wanna, um, I feel like I'd love to hear about your particular study, but I would say for, for this imagery, if I were to use the mean value within an area, um, if my area is smaller than a pixel of the imagery data that I'm using, then it's maybe more appropriate just to use a point um, rather than a box. So as you can see, our, our boxes are covering a ton of different pixels and then taking the mean. If your study area was just one pixel, you probably just use a point instead of a, a polygon. Yeah, do you wanna talk about your study or, or anything or any considerations that you think are specific to your study? I didn't have a specific study site in mind. I was just more or less curious about if, um, if there was a point when it would not be that efficient to study the, the changes of pixel. But your, your point about looking at a point instead of a geometric area, that is interesting also. Yeah, I, I don't, that's what's cool about Earth Engine. Um, there's no limit to the size. You can look at a super large area or a single pixel. Um, it's really flexible and scalable. My guess is that that would probably depend on what kind of questions you're asking. If you're if you're needing to have some kind of specific information about that pixel location, and you don't have enough either time dates to compare it to, or enough area in the same time date to compare to, then that that would um, make it challenging. And that was referring to the question about what is the minimum size for a study site. There's so much to consider with Earth Engine. There's just so many possibilities and that can be really overwhelming. So I just go to the example scripts and I try to look at what's possible to not be limited, you know? Let's look at some of the charts they got here. Seasonal temperatures. And I'll just hit run. Um, and if it looks cool, if the output looks cool, either on the map or in the console, I'll go through the code and, and try to figure out, you know, how'd they do this? What data did they use? Um, so yeah, that's, there's just so much that's possible. So I definitely don't know everything that's going on in Earth Engine and that's why the example scripts are so cool. I have a quick question and um, great workshop so far. Really enjoying it. Um, is it uh, do you do you often add your own imagery or algorithms and is it is Google Earth Engine flexible if you if you want to do that? Yeah, definitely. And that's that's one thing we thought about including but we weren't sure if there'd be time. Um, but Earth Engine does allow you to upload your own images or your own um, polygon or point data and that's in the assets tab. Um, so if I wanted to add, I, you can see a few examples here of some things I've added. Um, this little mountain icon means I've added an image, and then this means I've added uh, vector data or polygons or points in this case. Um, so I, I definitely play around with my own data, and I, I think Maggie touched on this. Earth Engine isn't that great for manipulating your data, and so I'll, I'll try to you know, get it exactly how I want it to look and edit it to be perfect. And then I add it to Earth Engine and say, you know, analyze this really long image collection at this point or at these points or map them over time. And so it's sort of like I do a lot of vector processing in ArcGIS and then throw it into Earth Engine to, to use the um, really powerful image collections. So if you're just doing a, a one image thing or making a pretty map, Earth Engine's kind of clunky, but um, I, I'll bring stuff in 
tested against the, the big data. Cool, thanks. That's interesting. <laughs> Hannah's is asking about Mediterranean oak borer. Yes, that's, uh, you nailed it. That's the bug we're looking at. And it looks like I'll, I'll quickly answer Dixon's question. Exactly correct. The NDVI values for the second chart oops, are taking the mean, um, you know, at this point, on August 28th, 2019, what was the mean NDVI value of every pixel within the, the box we created? I, and we can, we can change that from mean to median or minimum and the place, the place in the code to do that would be um, right here. So we could say, let's, let, let's look at the sum and I'll rerun this and see what happens. Um, pixels on the edge of a geometry how are those kept or removed from the calculation? No, I actually don't know if there, my instinct would be that if a pixel is not fully included in a box that it's excluded entirely, but I actually don't know. Oh, Sean responded. Oh, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for David's question, but I would be curious if, if someone finds out. Let's see what happened with the sun. I don't know either how it's treated in an Earth engine. Yikes. Here's the NDVI sum map. I don't even know what to say there. So, <laughs> you know, I haven't worked with this reducer a lot. And I'm guessing that depending on the size of our bounding boxes weren't the exact same size and some wouldn't be as interesting, wouldn't be directly comparable. I don't think I made them the same size exactly. So maybe some was a bad example to try. Okay, 312. We are on our final step. Really exciting. Um, we're flying through this work and if there's time, we'll get to do some nice cleanup, you know, cherry on top kind of stuff um, before we wrap up at four. Okay, so step six is all about, you know, that's great. We've calculated NDVI. I'm gonna rerun this to get rid of this ugly um, map. So, you know, we've seen how NDVI is changing between two different areas over time. But we, what if we're interested in asking a question like, how did NDVI change between 2020 and 2019 to sort of get a, a look at these longer term comparisons? And this is a common method. Um, it's called image differencing. It's a way to, to, to detect if change has occurred essentially by subtracting an image by another image to see how much change occurred between two different years. That's a little complicated though, because we're not just looking at two different years. We have 145 Sentinel images at this site between these two years. So the, um, the first step, step 6.1.a, is to create what's called a composite image. So compositing is a great feature in Earth Engine. I use this all the time. I'll take an image collection, filter to the date period that I'm interested in, and then use a function called median to say, take the median value across this entire um, image collection for each pixel. So that's called an annual median composite. It's a really common method. And medians do a great job of filtering out outliers that might be due to clouds or different sensor malfunctions. So um, you'll frequently see uh, annual median composite and that's what we're gonna create together. All right, back in the code editor, I'm gonna say create annual median composite for 2019 imagery. I can't remember exactly how I did this. I'm just going to glance at the worksheet. Okay, great. So we're going to create annual meeting closet 2019 of NDVI. And for that reason, we're going to call this new image NDVI 2019. Set that equal to, let me see what I did. Okay, great. So first we're going to um, grab that whole image collection that we've been working with. This is the image collection that we use to make these two charts. It's called S2 NDVI. This time though, we're gonna filter, uh, oops, filter the dates using the filter date function to just 2019 imagery. 
So you might remember how to do this. We did this really early on in the workshop. In this case, instead of um, saying filter anything from 2019 to 2021, which would you know cut us off at the start of 2021, I'm gonna say cut us off at the start of 2020. I only want images taken in 2019. So that's what we've done here. We also remember we have 23 bands and we, we don't care about you know, 22 of them. We just wanna select this NDVI band for now. So to do that, I'm gonna use the select function again and use the single quotes to select the NDVI band. Finally, the all powerful median function. This is super cool. It doesn't require any inputs. It's just acting on this, you know, everything I've highlighted, this is an image collection we've created. It's just 2019, it's just NDVI, and we're saying take the median of, at each pixel, take the median value of NDVI, and that'll filter out a lot of noise. Fabulous. I'm gonna copy and paste this now. Add some new lines so it's, it's more centered. And we're gonna do the same, except changing it to 2020. I'm gonna change all the 2019s to 2020. Filter date, so starting in 2020 and then excluding anything at the start of 2021. Check my work, okay, and hit save. So now we're on, oh, in step C here in 6.1.C, I just talked about how you can filter by month and date. So frequently people will filter in California to just the fall when they would expect um, vegetation stress to be highest or they'll filter for the spring. They wanna see how green everything gets in the spring. So in this case, we're taking the median of the whole year but you can definitely sub-select a, a portion of the year and that's in the worksheet if you're interested in doing that. But for now, we're just gonna take these two images, 2019 and 2020 and subtract 2019 from the 2020 image. There's a really simple function that does that so I'm gonna say create an image with the difference in NDVI. I'm gonna call this, what do we call it? NDVI diff, set that equal to, so just like I said, I'm gonna take the 2020 image, just called NDVI dot for 2020. We're gonna say dot subtract. So we're subtracting from the 2020 image and then our only input for the subtract is going to be a 2019 image. So this is, you know, obviously not ideal. It's not as easy as just saying like one minus two, but that's essentially what we're doing. We're saying 2020 minus 2019 and create an image with that difference. Okay, great. I'm gonna hit save. So um, I get a little turned around when I'm subtracting. In this case, you can just remember that um, positive values are areas where the NDVI has increased between these two years. Negative values, we've seen a decrease in NDVI. Okay, now we're gonna add this change image to the map, but we thought you guys would be ready to level up a little bit and make it interesting, add a little color to our image. By default, if we added this difference image to the map, it would make it um, from white to black sort of the white to black color ramp, what's called a grayscale image. That's kind of boring and maybe a little bit hard to interpret. So in this case, we wanna use what's called a color palette. So a color palette in Earth Engine is the same as um, a color ramp, if you're familiar with other GIS software. In this case, um, Earth Engine uses these really weird color codes. There's some information on it in the worksheet. I'm at the end of page 12 in the worksheet. Um, and I'm going to copy that color palette over just to give you a visual of what this looks like. So I'm creating a new variable called NDVI palette, and then I'm giving it a ton of color codes that are essentially going from brown, negative values, to green, positive values. You can play with that. Um, if you're interested, these first two values are the red brightness. These are the green brightness in the middle, and then the last two values are the blue brightness, and they vary from zero to F. That's why this looks so weird to our, uh, to my untrained eye, and I can't interpret these color codes. I am using a pre-existing palette, and I sent a link, or a, there's a link in the worksheet that shows you how to make a palette um, 
and where to find these color codes when you want to get creative. Okay, so let's add it to the map. Add change image to the map. We're pros at this at this point. Map to add layer, it gets less and less weird looking every time. So remember the object we're adding is NDVI underscore diff. The next parameter or input is the visualization parameters in those curly brackets. But you might remember, you know, before we, when we had a point, we said, this is the color. When we had a multi-band image, we said, here are the bands to use, and here's the minimum and maximum value. But in this case, we're using a palette, so that's a little different. So for a single band image, you can set the palette. Um, no worries if that's confusing. I agree, it's a little confusing. So we're going to set the palette equal to NDVI palette. And in this case, uh, I'm going to set the minimum and maximum so that they are exactly balanced around zero. Zero meaning um, very little change occurred between the years. And our zero value is white. That's that all high values in the color code there. So in this case, um, I took a look at this change image already. And I'm going to set the max and the minimum value to negative. 0.15 and the maximum to 0 0.15. Um, so it's perfectly balanced around zero so that no change values are shown in white. Okay, that's, that's all we need to set for visualization. And then I'm going to name this, what did we decide to name it? Change in NDVI. Add a semicolon, save, run. I'm actually shocked I haven't hit errors while doing this live. If you're hitting errors, just let us know. It's really common. Um, so we can help you out with that. Okay, super cool. So just like we expected, we're seeing areas that decrease between these two images in that brown color and areas that increase in green, areas with about the same median value between the two years in this white color. Um, I think it's fun to use this slider over here, the transparency slider to uh, look at the underlying imagery that we use to calculate it. And so you can see, oh, you know, a lot of these areas that saw a decline happen to be oak woodlands or populated with trees and that these grassland, open grassland areas actually didn't experience much change. So that might indicate, depending on your study area, you know, did a fire burn through a forest? Did a bark beetle burn through, come through your forest? Um, or is a drought impacting the vegetation health uh, negatively over time? So these are all possibilities. How are, folks, how are folks doing with this step? Does this make sense? Chippy threw up a heart, love it. I can only see like three people's names, so I'm sorry if other folks are using emojis. I appreciate you if you are. Um, okay. Now we're ready for our final official step in the workshop, which is exporting this change image. So this is frequently what I want to do in Earth Engine. I wanna use hundreds of images and then calculate them down into one resulting raster or image result. Um, so in this case, it's our change image. I'm using 145 Sentinel images, I've extracted some really cool information. And now it's small and bite-sized enough that I might export it and make a pretty map in ArcMap maybe, or some other um, GIS software. Oh, I'm just gonna check the chat. Oh yeah, so um, negative values are in this brown color and positive values are in the green. And so a positive value is an increase in the NDVI between 2019 and 2020. And the brown values are areas where NDVI decreased between those two years. So 2020 had a lower NDVI than 2019. Let's see some of that. Okay. So you wanna export this really cool image you made. So let's, let's talk about what that would look like. Export the change image. This is surprisingly straightforward. It's just one line of code. Um, there are a couple of different export uh, functions. Actually, I'll just show you what those are so that you can explore. I'm going to the docs tab. I'm going to filter that for export. And you can see I can export an image. I could export it 
to an asset, which means it's going to be in my Earth Engine account. I can export it to cloud storage. That's very uncommon. That's the Google paid service. Or export it to your Google Drive. That's most common. Uh, other cool options, though, if you made a bunch of features, you could export your features as a table. If you have an image collection, you could export an image collection in a given area as a video. This is super cool. So say you just want to explore um, change over time in a given area. This is a great way to explore that image collection. OK, so we're going to use this export image to drive. And you'll see the only required parameter is that image uh, information. So export image to drive and DBI diff. OK, fabulous. I hit save hit run and I'll show you what exports look like. So all exports in Earth Engine are create what's called a task. Tasks are really important for these heavy lifting things because you're able to run a task in the background. So if I'm exporting a bunch of images, it's so um, helpful to have them run in the background as tasks. Instead of having them run in the script, which would prevent me from doing any other Earth Engine stuff while it was exporting. So they chose to make exports um, run as what's called a task. So to see those tasks, we go over here to the task tab in the far right. And you'll see I've got a new task that I can choose to run or not. So all that this line of code did was set up an export and make it possible to run from the task tab. So it's not running yet. So I'll show you what it would look like to run the export. So I'll click this button, run on the task tab. I'm just gonna quickly monitor the chat in case there's a question. Don't see anything in my tasks tab. Huh, that's really weird. And you, you copy and paste this line and, and hit run. Oh, she sees it now, awesome. That's good because I definitely didn't have a solution for that problem. Okay, so now we've got our task. We're going to hit run and we see this pop up with all these options. So the task name is just what it's going to be listed as. And if you have a lot of exports, it could be helpful to, to call it something like NDVI change export. Scale. Um, there are a couple different options here. Scale is most likely. If you wanted to export your image at the highest possible resolution, you would say 10. Just like we talked about earlier, the Sentinel imagery is going to have 10 meter spatial resolution of the pixels. Um, and so if you wanted the highest resolution possible and you wanted to retain that, you use 10. That's going to take a long time. So I'm going to keep it at 1,000. And that's going to export a coarser resolution imagery image, but it'll take up less space in my drive and it'll take up less time. So just for the sake of the workshop, I'm going to use that option. Um, I can't remember. I think my. I have a drive folder called Earth Engine where I put a lot of exports. So that's what I'm going to call it. But this, if you don't put anything in the drive folder, it'll just go straight into your main drive. Um, and then file name, I'm going to say NDVI diff, maybe 2020 to 2019. You could name it whatever helps you remember. And then I would press run. So that this function allows you to set all of that in, in the code if you'd like to. You can see there's a bunch of different options. Like if you wanted to change the region that it clipped to or um, anything else for format options, you could do that in the line of code. But it's not necessary. The pop-up will let you do that uh, over here. One really important thing about exports is that it's going to export whatever portion of the image was visible in my map view when I pressed export. That's super annoying sometimes. I'll press export and then realize I zoomed in really far and I have to redo the export. So um, in that case, it can be really useful to set the region in the function. Um, I didn't do that today. I'm just exporting a small strip that I was looking at. So does, does that make sense to folks? Exports? Sound good? Awesome. Okay, and that's really the meat of this workshop. That's, that's, these are some of my favorite 
functions um, that we really wanted to show you. And I'll just overview some of the things you learned today. You learned how to import and pre-process Sentinel imagery so that it's ready to be um, analyzed, analysis ready data, totally cloud masked um, and filtered to your study area. You also learned how to calculate NDVI and add it to your data set and work with that NDVI information, really valuable. Um, and there you can calculate dozens of different uh, vegetation indices, just like Maggie was saying. We also learned how to look at changes in an index over time at a point or between two areas. Really awesome capability in Earth Engine that I use all the time. Um, this is also something really useful that I think I didn't realize how important it would be, but creating annual median composites or composites for a given time of year or um, you know, creating these mosaic images using the best data available within a time frame. This I do all the time. So we really wanted to make sure you got to see what that looks like. Um, and then so easy to work with image algebra here. We're just using one function to create a change image uh, using subtract. And there are a bunch of other uh, cool image algebra functions available. And you saw how to add something to the map um, to change the color of a feature to use a palette to look at a one band image in color. And then you also looked at how to look at a multi band image um, using whatever subset of bands you choose to. That's quite a wide breadth of different things you learned. And I hope that some of those you just get to cut and paste in the future and keep using and adapting. Uh, in particular, I hope you take advantage of the chart. I really like that. And I'll take any questions right now. And then we have an option to dive into some um, to the question earlier about filtering out a single image, we're going to optionally, for folks who are not too exhausted on a Friday afternoon, take a look at what it would take to filter out images that we just know don't look good. Um, so I definitely want to take questions now and let folks go. If you're not interested in filtering out bad data, you know, that might not be your cup of tea. That's okay. You've accomplished a lot. Oh, actually, you know, then now would be a good time to take a group photo and make sure folks have the feedback form. And Annie, I have one question from an email I received about the possibility of uploading your own imagery for analysis and if that's possible. That's a great question. So we talked about this a bit on a break and so not everyone got to got to see this, but assets tab is where you would upload your own imagery or vector data. Um, so this I think is, you wouldn't have, it wouldn't look this way. I signed up for a weird type of account that has this cloud asset thing, but um, you'd be able to upload your own imagery and vector data by going to your assets tab and clicking new. You can see you can upload a geotiff or shapefile or CSV containing flat long information. Um, yeah. I actually have a like a bit of a follow up on that. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of like when it makes sense to do the like algorithmic processing of the imagery with Google Earth Engine or or kind of like do it offline and then upload the like the output map, like let's say um, I wanted to count seal populations in Antarctica and I was using the latest and greatest deep learning algorithm to detect the seals and I could output a map of their locations and I could see that it would probably work really well, especially with like the kind of charts that you showed to upload a map of their locations and then you could like do the counts by, by little regions and time series and that would be really nice. Um, but is there a point where it makes sense to actually do the, like, uh, deploy a deep learning model to Google Earth Engine and, do, and, and let the engine do the processing? Yeah, that's an awesome question and gives me an excuse to talk about some of the classification algorithms that are built in. Um, so I'm just, I've gone to the Docs tab and searched for classifiers, and you can see there are some, um, really cool built-in classification algorithms, some of which are incorporate 
machine learning like uh, random forest. Um, I, but for like a neural network or really advanced deep learning algorithm, they do, um, Earth Engine is trying to speak directly to TensorFlow, which a lot of folks use for that really advanced uh, machine learning thing. So I'm trying to find anything on TensorFlow in the docs. But they have great online tutorials on how to use TensorFlow to do some really powerful machine learning and then import, you know, speak back and forth with Earth Engine to display the data or crosswalk the data with other cool data sets that are in Earth Engine. I hope that yeah thanks yeah i'll google around for that that sounds interesting i mean I, it's it seems super useful that it would like chip up the large images for you and kind of handle all that behind the scenes so that's that's definitely de desirable i just i wonder if it's like a, a robust feature yet or if it's um i mean it it should speak well with tensorflow i, I imagine but yeah thank you that that was that was super helpful thanks yeah, I look forward to hearing hearing what you end up using because TensorFlow super cool, but I it's an advanced application I haven't used yet. Um, yeah. Okay, before I go on to this optional data cleaning piece, I want to take a look around the room and if folks are willing to let us snap a group photo of you all, or you know, it's a, totally okay to keep your camera off. But if you want to be part of the group photo, you can flip your camera on and we'll give a countdown and take a screenshot. Annie, also David had a question about, I think this is one of um, our previous workshops with Luke. So you might not know the oh. answer, but Andy or Sean might. Oh yeah, I might have, it might be a dead link. And I, um, I'll, I'll look into that. Sorry about that. Okay, does someone know how to sort the rooms that everyone with their camera on is at the top? Are you taking the, the photo, Maggie? I can, but I, um, I I don't know how to do that. That okay. is, but I'll figure it out. Hold on, everybody look good. Just hold those. <laughs> we, we can do a screen capture. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, uh, we'll do a couple of them. Oh, wow, no warning. Everyone, I hope you're smiling. So it might have been a test, test okay. run. Okay. Let me see if I can try to get everybody in. <laughs> I think, nope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do it twice. Okay, we're gonna do it twice, y'all. So stay. Everybody Oops. smile. Everybody smile. Whoops, that wasn't, didn't work. Sorry, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I can do it, Maggie. But I, yeah, that's hilarious how I am not doing great. Okay, ready? <laughs> We're ready. Annie's laughing, which is always good. Okay, that was shot one. Now let me do page two. You guys don't know who you, which one is which, you know, which is, um, Okay. Terrifying, yeah. All right. So now we're going to do page two capture. Yay. Yay. Thanks, Maggie. And thanks, everyone, for coming out today. I really love being with all of you, even virtually. I feel like questions you ask every time help us refine this workshop. Um, and yeah, it's just great to be, you know, coding an Earth Engine with all of you. It's really fun. Okay, and, so we're gonna drop and, it in the chat. Oh, go ahead, John. Oh, and one more thing. This this workshop has been recorded. It'll take a little bit of time for it to render online, but I can send out the link next week to everyone to download it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. And Annie has in the chat link um, our eval form. And we really do love it when you guys give us feedback. So it's not one of those things where we just ask and don't ever look at it. We really do like it. So if you could take a few minutes to do that, we'd very much appreciate it. Definitely. 
I'm so thankful for all of you. I'm thankful for the IGIS team that made it really easy to run a workshop, um, even remotely. And so if you're game, I'm gonna filter out some bad imagery that we had. And if that's not exciting to you, then the instructions are in the worksheet and you can come back at another time and do that on your own. And I'll send um, the photo around to everybody. Oh, awesome. That'd be great. And one more thing, uh, we usually like to plug our IGIS office hours on Mondays and Tuesdays. You can find that the link to that through our IGIS website. And this allows a lot of people when they learn something in the workshop to then continue to use it if they have questions later on. I'm just gonna drop that link in the chat for office hours. You can get help with Earth Engine or many other types of software. So we're game. Okay, I'm gonna get back into Earth Engine then. Now that we've taken a nice breather, smiled at each other for a couple minutes, uh, I'll walk it, walk us through what it would look like to filter out some uh, some of that funky imagery. Okay, let me go back to the workshop. Oh, and the other thing really quick that's just optional for folks to do, you'll see on this map that my, I've got imagery data on top of these boxes, on top of this image, on top of a point. And it's pretty annoying. You can't rearrange these once they've been added to the map. So what you can do um, is look back at all the layers you've added. So let's see, um, added the point to the map. I'm going to cut and put that at the end. And so um, any, basically the order of this layers tab is the order that they were added. So the thing on top will be the last thing that you added. So I'm just going to add um, the point. I'm going to copy and paste the point to the bottom. And then I'm going to copy and paste, or cut and paste, I should say, um, the two boxes, the two areas. That's just a nice way to clean up your map so that things are in order that makes sense to you, but totally optional. Okay, the second optional thing is to filter out funky images, and this is really common. Um, and so it's nice to know uh, the workflow, how you might do it. So in step two of this optional wrap up at the end of the worksheet, I'm on page 14. You'll see I um, have some code there that isolates the June imagery. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go back up. Where did I? Oh yeah, okay. We can add this at any point, but I'm going to let the vector data still be the last thing I add to the map. So at the end of my script, but before I add the point data and the box data, I'm going to paste that, that code. Basically what this is doing is saying, create a new variable called the June 14 image. Um, oh wow, this export is still running. Mistake, clearly I think we overloaded their server. Um, I'm gonna say create a new variable called the June 14 image. Take that image collection we built called S2NDVI, this is sort of our final processed image collection, and filter the dates just to, the, to June 14. So in this case, I'm saying anything after the 13th and before the 15th, this is inclusive. So if there had been an image taken on the 13th, we might have two images, um, but Sentinel does not, doesn't work that way. It just, it's not that fast. So this is just one image. I'm gonna add it to the map, saying add June 14 image to the map. Same visualization parameters that we used before um, when we were adding true color Sentinel imagery and then give it a name just like we've done countless times at this point, hit save and run. So at this point, I've just isolated the image based on a filtering by date and then added it to the map to check it out. You can already tell this image is problematic. What's going on? Um, we've got, let me get rid of the Sentinel-2 imagery. It's just taking a long time to load. I have so many layers. So here's what that image looks like. And off the bat, this looks really incorrect. We are seeing this huge band of turquoise, this band of blue. Over here, it looks decent, but it's just not working in our study area. Some type of sensor error might've happened. 
Um, so we'd like to filter out this image. In order to do that, I'm going to, essentially what we need to do is figure out the ID of this particular image. You're always gonna use an image ID to isolate an individual image um, in the most accurate way possible. So this is sort of a way to grab something by date, but we're gonna print it out to the console to get that exact image ID. So I'm gonna say print June 14 to the console. Same as we did before when we've been printing um, image collections, we're just gonna give the name of the object to print. Slap on the semicolon, save again. All right, so in this case, it's an image collection of one image. And we're able to get the ID here. Copernicus S2, blah, 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 blah. Really long ID. So you would copy and paste that ID. I don't know why, I think I need to zoom out in order to look at the whole ID. Copy. Actually, um, this is the name of the image collection. So I'm just gonna copy everything after the image collection name. This is the image ID here on the end. Okay, so we successfully isolated the image and figured out its ID. So I'm gonna zoom back in so that we can see. And it wouldn't do as much good to filter that image out of the image collection after we've added it to the map a bunch of times and it's already in our chart analysis. So in that case, what we're going to want to do is filter out this image, but back up um, right before we use this image collection for charting. So to do that, I'm gonna find before I used it for charting. Okay, this is where we created that final image collection. So this is probably a good place to filter out the June 14 image. I'm just gonna paste that ID there so that I have it. So here's uh, what that code would look like. We would say S2MDVI equals, so much like with the chart when we're setting the options, we're just modifying this uh, collection. We're not creating a new one. So I'm gonna say S2MDVI equals S2MDVI, except we'd like to filter this image collection. And so we filtered by bounds, we filtered by date. In this case, we're gonna filter by an image ID. And to do that, we have to use a filter object. So in this case, ee.filter, we've seen that before. And we're gonna use the not equals filter. Let's take a look at what this function takes as an input. Okay. Filter to the metadata. So you say the property of the metadata that you're filtering on, and then the value that you don't want to include or that you want to filter out of your uh, image collection. So in this case, the name of the property is, it's kind of ugly. Um, the name of the property is system index with a weird colon in the middle. This is just how the imagery IDs are stored in Earth Engine. Um, and it's okay not to know that, it's something I definitely had to look up or get from an example script. And then I'm going to say the value that I wanna filter out, I'm gonna cut and paste that image ID um, into the function. So now we have um, filter this image collection by anything with the system index not equaling this image ID. Thrown on a semicolon, which I forgot. Okay, I think that's all we have to do. I'm just gonna press run and see if that filters it out. Wonderful, okay. So now we no longer have that like value of one, you know, NDVI of one <laughs> up here. And you can see that the chart axes have readjusted. So that's, sort of the workflow that I use to, um, you know, these time series are a great way to say, I don't think that value from that day looks realistic.
Can we hone in on the image ID? Should we add it to the map and check out what might be wrong? If it looks unsalvageable, let's just exclude it from our uh, image collection. Yeah, so that's, that's what that looks like. Are there any questions from the folks who stuck around? Awesome. I'm gonna stick around for another 10 minutes in case people have questions specific to their work. I also dropped my email in the worksheet a couple times, but I'll include it in the chat. I really um, love solving Earth Engine uh, problems as much as I can. And so hit me up on email and we can work through it together or in office hours at the link that we provided earlier. Um, yeah, so, so definitely shoot me an email, here to help. And I'll draw my email again. Any other questions? I'm gonna drop the feedback form that really helped us improve last time and I'm sure it will again. Thanks for all the gratitude in the chat. I feel thankful for all of you and all the support from IGIS. It was really critical. Oh yeah, Krista, let's talk. Okay, how do you know when to make a variable a function versus um, I feel like I need to versus, I guess, not making a function. Maybe I just don't totally understand what a function is or when to use it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I frequently use functions to uh, when I know what I need to do to each individual image, but it's not possible to write code that would do that to a whole section of images at once. So that's when I would write a function to work on one image and then use map to map it over the whole collection. So that's frequently why I would, you know, instead of, I think, um, I'll share my screen, sorry. You know, the alternative, instead of add NDVI, you could just say, you know, var NDVI equals one sentinel image and then add this, you know, that, that wouldn't require a function. That's just applying tools to one image and creating a new variable. And the reason we needed this function is that we want to do that to many images all at once. I don't know. Is that I think that makes sense. Yeah, because usually when I run into the issue, it's um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to clip to a specific area of interest, but it's pretty much always when I'm doing a time series too. So your comment about multiple images is helpful. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'm happy to talk uh, talk through your script too. And uh, you can let me know on email if you wanna set up a time. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes these are really quick fixes and we just need another set of eyes. So yeah, don't hesitate. Um, there's another question in the chat. Quickly review um, where I got the Copernicus ID uh, the image ID in looking at the bad image. Yeah, so this was a little bit, little bit quick, a little bit confusing. To get the image ID, we used this code at the bottom of, um, bottom of the worksheet, bottom of my script that I'm showing you here. So we said, uh, filter by the date, blah, 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 add it to the map, and then we printed it to the console. This is how we got the image ID. We printed it to the console. And if you're ever, you see I have all these things printed, it could be confusing. Cool thing with print is I could add um, some text in those single quotes and then use a comma to separate it from whatever object. That way when I run it again, I'll know what I was printing. So I went to the console after printing it. And um, this is the ID of the image collection. We saw that earlier when we imported the imagery. But to get to the ID of the Oh, you know, there's nothing in this because we already filtered it out. Oh, geez. Sorry, I'm gonna comment out that line and rerun it. Um, so you see, there's my little label there, really helpful.
This is the ID of the whole image collection. And then to get the ID of that image, we're gonna look at features. There's only one image feature. I shouldn't say feature, that they all turned around. We're looking at one image in the image collection. And it gives us this whole ID here in the name of the image. So there are two places you can get the ID. You could say, okay, this is the image ID, but I don't need this image collection information at the front. I'm just gonna filter by this ID number and that's equal to the system index. That is also copied below in ID. You can see I'm just excluding this Copernicus S2SR because um, that's the image collection ID. We don't, uh, we, we need to exclude that in order to filter by this image specific ID. And in reality, those are both shortcuts. The real thing that we're filtering on is an image property. So if I expand property, I go all the way down to system index, that's what we're filtering on. So you can, you can choose to do that, find the ID there, but it's, it's, also, um, oops. it's also right here. It's the same as the system index. Does that make sense? Okay, how would I filter out a list of images? So you could exclude a list of IDs um, using, I think I'll turn it around in my uh, script. Okay, I'm just using Apple or Command Find to find that line. Um, so in this case, we're just filtering by one image ID. If you had multiple image IDs, I think you could either copy and paste this line or I'm gonna check using control space. It doesn't look like we can filter by list, but I'm sure there is some um, filter method to do that. Filter contains, see so you could. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I can search there. That's yeah, oh, filter in list, that is promising. So that you could say, just give me the stuff in this list of IDs. Um, maybe list contains does that. Yeah, so that's sort of how I would figure that out. Um, but I don't have an answer for you right now. Oh, cool. Okay, so Daniel's comment in the chat, instead of finding the ID of a broken image or filtering on the system index ID, one can also filter on the general quality property not being failed. So that would just in general, just like we did a cloud mask to filter out cloudy pixels, you could say filter out any failed general quality images. That's a great idea. And um, you would find that down here under image properties. Let's just do it together. That sounds kind of fun. General quality failed, great point. Okay, from Ludovica. Sorry if this is a silly question. Probably not. How can we tell the frequency of images in a collection? That's a great question. It's not um, obvious based on what we what we did. The these time series give you an idea, so you can say like, okay, when there's no uh, break between two points of missing data, you could say, all right, we're there on June twenty third. You know, that's about a 10 day difference, but my computer is like a little bit overloading. Yeah, so maybe every 10 days so you could assess it that way. Or I would go to my favorite search bar, look at the imagery metadata and try to find information on uh, the temporal frequency or sometimes it's called its revisit frequency. Doesn't look like there's anything here. Sentinel-2, I think, is built, it's, the image collection is built from two different satellites. Uh, it's a constellation of satellites with the same sensor on them. And so I think the revisit frequency has decreased in some places to every five days. Does that sound right to people? Yeah, I would just Google this satellite, actually. Does anyone know if you can find that out in Earth Engine? Oh, you know, the other thing we did was printed the image collection. 
and you saw how you visually can um, assess the dates, just looking at these ideas, IDs. So January 5th, January 10th, January 15th. So that looks like five days there. Yeah, but not that intuitive, huh? Okay, it's getting on to 4 p.m. on a Friday, at least here in Berkeley. So I definitely wanna let folks go, but I'm hoping to work with any or all of you in office hours or on any problems you run into. So many great questions. Um, and I know we didn't answer all of them, but I hopefully you got sent on the right path to figure out how to answer your question. Definitely. Okay. I thought it was great, Annie. Thank you so much. And I will send out a link to uh, Maggie's presentation, as well as another reminder to fill out the evaluation. And I noticed to everyone that wasn't able to attend about the recording of the workshop, which I'll send out next week. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. That was a blast. Hope you have a good weekend and I hope I get to work with you soon on Earth Engine stuff.